every developed market is facing the same problems in terms of high inflation, slowing growth, declining real wages. This is going to amp up pressure on policymakers. It's going to be a tough call for the Fed, to be honest. They let the inflation genie surge out of the bottle much too rapidly with their shift to a backward-looking paradigm. It's going to be a rough road the second half of 2022. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Some big moves out there this morning, live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This <clears throat> is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Brown with some Jonathan Farrow. Futures down at one full percentage point. TK, where do you want to begin? Well, we'll Stocks, begin bonds, FX? It's, it's there. It's there. We've got J.P. Morgan and Morgan Stanley, but I'll be honest, John, suddenly they're a sideshow to what's going on in the markets. I thought Larry McDonald and Zero Hedge were the tour de force on, John, how EM is catching up with what we see in the developed countries, the idea that the Egypt nine-year piece is down 20-some percent. Well, so what? Except all of a sudden it's happening, John. It redounds back to Chairman Powell. Seeing EM-like moves in dollar yen, Tom. Mm -hmm. Dollar yen, 139 early this morning. We've got the deepest yeah. yield curve inversion in the Treasury market, twos versus tens, going back to the year 2000. This is some big stuff. It's big stuff. Yeah, that's exactly right, John. That's really well put. It's big stuff, and suddenly it's there. And let's go. we got, we got to get Jean Bovin on as a former deputy governor of the Bank of Canada over what Canada did yesterday. Are they leading the way for the adults in the room? They went 100. Bramo, will the Fed follow <laughs> month end? That is the discussion right now, and currently the market is pricing in about a 50% chance of one and two chance that the Fed will go that way. And frankly, the Fed officials who have spoken so far are not doing anything to dampen that speculation. We heard uh, yesterday basically confirmation from the Fed's uh, Atlanta Fed's uh, Rafael Bostic basically saying, we'll do whatever it takes. Everything's on the table. This is not a good print. We heard that from uh, from Loretta Mester of the Cleveland Fed. The message is clear. They are concerned. This was a terrible CPI report for them. We want to make sure this morning that we don't get lost in this 75 basis point versus 100 basis point high story month end. The debate has got to be much bigger than that. I've put this out on Twitter this morning. We've got to ask the following questions. Is there evidence from the June CPI report that this is stickier and broader and with us for longer? And with that in mind, Tom, are there are upside risks to the hiking cycle in the second half of this year because there are two camps right now looking at this market. The number one camp at the moment is you look at June, you say energy is going to fade. That's the worst of it. Then number two, you look at June, you say this is stickier. Look at Shouter. This is going to be with us yes. for longer. The Fed will have to do more. That's going to shape your view on this market. It will shape your view on, the, on this Fed in a much bigger way, too. Yeah, nicely placed, John. And what I would do off the research notes is suggest the people that focused on Shelter not so much said the other side is wrong, but that we're ever more data dependent now. And that data dependency, yeah, used cars move, but you know what? It is about shelter is a broader statement. Let's get into these markets. We are down by one full percentage point on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq 100, we're down nine tenths of 1%. Euro dollar, a clean break of parity yesterday for the first time since 2002. We have a weaker euro on our hands. Weaker currencies across the board, just a stronger dollar, rip roar in US dollar through the year so far. And on the session this morning, too, yields up three basis points, the 296, 50. And Lisa, there it is again. Get used to this. We might be looking at the 80s pretty quickly on crude. WTI, $94. And Lisa, down another 2.3%. It's really surprising, especially given some of the analyst calls for the tightness of the oil market, considering the fact that this has been one of the main drivers of inflation. How quickly can it come down to actually alleviate some of these pressures? And is it enough, given how broad-based, exactly as you were saying, John, the CPI report showed the inflationary winds are today? I know this is something very special for you, John. J.P. Morgan and Morgan Stanley earnings and earnings calls uh, are going to be rolled out. And this is really kicking off the Q2 earnings season. I want to understand how the Jamie Dimon, we're facing a hurricane kind of statement, translate into the tea leaves of what they're actually seeing at a time when the GDP now of the Atlanta Fed does show a negative read for the second quarter. Are we looking at something similar, according to at least uh, J.P. Morgan and their granular data? At 8.30 a.m., we get U.S. initial jobless claims and U.S. June PPI. PPI I'm actually more interested in 
than initial jobless claims, although both very important to give an ongoing current read to really give some color to the CPI report. With the PPI, how much do we see materials continuing to increase those input costs that will continue to pressure margins at a time when we are seeing consumers become a little bit more sensitive to price? And at 11.30 a.m., our own uh, M Michael McKee is going to be moderating a discussion with the Fed Governor Chris Waller. Very curious to hear how he talks about where the market is currently pricing in interest rates at the end of the year. And John, to your point, it is not about 100 basis points or 75 basis points. It's what happens after that and after that and after that. And right now the market is pricing in a 3.7% interest rate at the end of this year, really bringing forward some of the forecasts from earlier. That is the big debate taking place on Wall Street right now. Bramo, thank you. And again, looking forward to Mike McKee sitting down with Governor Waller a little bit later on today. Joining us now is Margie Patel, Senior Portfolio Manager at Allspring Global Investments. And Margie, it does come down to this for a lot of people. Do you look at June as the worst of it, energy's going to fade? Or do you look at June as evidence that this is stickier? We've got to get used to this being with us for longer and this Fed has got to do a whole lot more. I, I, t I think that actually we're pretty much near the peaking of the CPI. Uh, yesterday may not have been the absolute peak, but the next month I think surely will. And uh, what I'm concerned about is the Fed focusing so much on the headline inflation. They're losing track of an economy which is losing momentum, uh, real wages which are declining. And pretty much around the world, you see economic distress. Emerging markets have debt problems. Uh, Europe has very slow growth problems. And I'm afraid if they pursue their typical path of aggressively tightening, focusing on interest on uh, inflation, that they will do real harm to the economy. That's what I think the stock market is telling us here. Margie, you just said pretty much around the world. You're too young to remember 1998. Unfortunately, Margie, I remember it. And all of a sudden, the correlations click in. How far behind is pretty much around the world? How far behind is EM, et cetera, from what we're seeing in major, major things we're focusing on? Well, I think that's a very good point that when bad things happen, they tend to get clustered and happen all at once and everything is correlated down. And that almost looks as if we're on the precipice of that with the, the aspect of what the Fed is going to do. So, yes, I think it's happening more or less simultaneously. Emerging markets have had big problems building for years and it didn't matter till we had this huge spike in basic commodities. Uh, again, Europe has its own problems with energy, low growth. So this to me says this is a time where the market's reflecting economic reality, not necessarily where rates are. Rates will come down on inflation as we see a much slower economy. Margie, based on what we have seen with the CPI reports and perhaps not what the Fed should be following, but what they are following, have you changed your uh, positive outlook, particularly on risk assets? Uh, a little bit, yes, because it seems that it's going to be unavoidable to um, not have a real earnings slowdown. I think it'll be interesting this quarter. I think earnings will be pretty good or surprisingly good, but their outlooks for the rest of the year, I think, may be much more guarded, and I don't think the market's going to like that. I think it all rolls back to the economy's losing momentum, and the Fed is aggressively tightening. They're looking in the rearview mirror, and uh, it seems like they want to repeat the mistake they've made in other cycles. Margie, when it's like this, what do CFOs do? Do they issue more debt? Do they use this as an opportunity? Well, they have been doing that over the last few <clears throat> years. They really have taken advantage of near zero interest rates. Uh, investment grade companies, companies that don't need the money at all, like say an Apple, and also junk companies have also aggressively raised cash on their books so their balance sheets are very strong, so they won't be cut off by the banks, so they can ride through a downward cycle in the economy. So corporate America really looks pretty good because they've already done that borrowing. Margie, good to catch up. Margie Patel there of All Spring good, Global Investments. Would a sell off be complete without Italy? Let's look at the Italian bond market. It yields up yeah. 24 basis points on a two-year. On a 10-year, up 21. And a conversation, Tom, about a confidence vote a little bit later in Italy and the prospect of the Italian yeah. government collapsing, going into a massive week for Europe with the ECB yeah. on deck and Nord Stream 1 coming back online, scheduled to come back online next Thursday. Our, our Rome Bureau was some real good, uh, good work on that with Carolyn Lucas as, as, as well. And, John, what is the ramification of Draghi is? Not pushed out, but just if, if Draghi's not renewed, if you will, to Italy. The technocratic government collapses, Tom, and then we're into the unknown. Who takes over? And the reason the ECB is important next week is because we've all talked about this anti-fragmentation <coughs> tool for so long. And, Lisa, what does that come down to? Supporting the Italian 
debt market for many people, that's exactly what it is. And that risk only increases, making it that much more challenging for the ECB to actually affect that. All of this really pinned, and when you mentioned the Nord Stream uh, reopening that we're expecting, or at least is scheduled, it really hinges on this. It basically indicates how much the ECB will be forced to raise rates, pressuring that dynamic and removing some of their support for the Italian bond market. I mean, talk <coughs> about the butterfly effect. Sure. That's what it feels like. Can you define what is a warranted tightening of financial conditions when you're raising interest rates and what is an unwarranted tightening of financial conditions. I guess that's in the eye of the beholder and the ECB gets to decide. I, what is warranted, what is unwarranted, if their sure. view is inflation, it's warranted. If their view is employment and stability and longer term economic prosperity, well, that's kind of out of their remit when you take a look at where the inflation rate is. And that is the conundrum that the Fed is struggling with as well. Well, you bring up the Fed. I liked what Neil Dutcher of Renaissance Macro has said recently about the Federal Reserve, Tom, that ultimately, yes, there's some kind of framework there. We can all try and get our hands around that. But over the last few months, this chairman has basically made a move and then picked a data point to support the move. And I think he, he did that with the pivot, too. He said it was down to the ECI. Then he said the difference between 50 and 75 was, oh, was you, I, Mitch. I, so if you're debating with yourself whether we get 75 to 100, it's whatever data this chairman wants to I, look at ultimately I, I, and make I, the yes, decision. I, I agree with that. But what we reaffirmed yesterday is how data dependent these central bankers are. A couple ideas, John. On a, and folks, I can't emphasize enough how odd the markets look this morning. Again, uh, I think Larry McDonald's article in Zero Hedge was absolute tour de force on the EM issues out there. John, Jerome Powell, a central banker to the world with a vengeance this morning. Shall I reach I out to Larry? Would you like to get Larry on? Well, I always want to talk to Larry, okay. but I, I want to say that Powell, a central banker to the world, ever more likely uh, this morning. And the other thing I'd say, John, is the behavior of Japanese yen is absolutely original. I've never seen it. How does this yield curve control model work, given the cacophony right now? Grandma, final word. Final word is that everyone has been surprised by inflation and central bankers have been humbled by their past mistakes in understanding it. And that is what we're hearing from how they are reading the current I, I, incoming data. My final word, John, is, is it's 768 miles from Frankfurt to Rome. We go over, we do ECB, and then get on an elephant and go back down to Rome. I was giving Lisa the final word. Oh, that's okay. my final Can, word. Uh, am it's I only... coming with you? Yeah, of that. course. Okay. I, mean, okay. I mean, we take an elephant to Rome and we do the show from Rome. I don't know why we're getting an elephant. We're down at 1% on the <laughs> S&P from New York. It's the least of my problems this morning. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Marisika Gupta. Officials at the Federal Reserve may debate a historic 1% point rate hike later this month. Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic told reporters that everything is in play after U.S. consumer prices rose a faster than expected 9.1% in the year through June, investors bet. The Fed is more than likely to hike rates by 100 basis points at the next meeting. In the UK, another round of Conservative Party balloting is set for today in the process that will determine the next Prime Minister. The field of candidates has now been cut to six. Former Chancellor Rishi Sunak and Trade Minister Penny Morden have emerged as the frontrunners. At least one member of the field will be knocked out after today's vote. President Biden is committing to extending an agreement that provides billions of dollars for the Israeli military. The president is in Israel and met today with Prime Minister Yair Lapid. The two leaders are calling for an extension of the agreement that now stretches through 2028. And there's another big name casualty from the $2 trillion cryptocurrency crash. Crypto lender Celsius Network has filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection in New York. Celsius has amassed more than $20 billion in assets by offering interest rates as high as 18% to depositors. It halted withdrawals last month in the midst of a panic run by clients. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. We're moving toward a two and a half percent what with the long run neutral rate is. My own belief is that we're going to need to go beyond that and well beyond that because, right, inflation and inflation expectations are higher than 2% now. So we're going to have to keep moving 
The Red MS there, the, the Cleveland Fed president weighing in after the CPI report yesterday evening from New York. Good morning. Here's your price action now. Down 39 on the S&P with negative one full percentage point on the Nasdaq 100, down <coughs> nine tenths of one percent. Into the bond market yields just a little bit higher, 296.32 on a 10 year curve inversion. The story there. Euro dollar, a break of parity yesterday. Dollar yen, a break of 139. Just some monster moves taking place in foreign exchange. Big moves in crude too. 93 handle on WTI, 93.98, down 2% on the day. On the month, <coughs> we're down more than 20% on WTI, Tom. Quite a move. Yeah, you've mentioned that twice, John. I'm glad you mentioned it. I mean, it, it, it's there, 124. We're down almost, wow, almost $30 on Brent crude. I mean, it's really an extraordinary move. John, what do you see in Europe? I mean, net gas, has it really pulled back? I mean, is it still a crisis for Germany? This all comes and down to Nord Stream is, yeah. 1 next week, Tom, yeah. without a doubt. It comes down to the ECB and you <clears> can throw in Italian politics for good measure too. It's messy. It's really messy. It, right now, we're going to go to Anne-Marie Horton in Jerusalem with the president of the United States. It is a president at the beginning of a trip in the Middle East. And Anne-Marie, I, I want to educate the audience here and myself that Jeddah is not Riyadh. The president will fly down the Red Sea over on the western shore of Saudi Arabia to their commercial hub. What will we observe when he lands in Jeddah? You know, the president is going to be greeted by a very different Saudi Arabia than the last time he was there. I believe the last time he was there was in 2011 when he was vice president. And having myself gone to the kingdom a number of times, whether it was Jeddah, Riyadh, or Dehran, it has changed dramatically. The last time I was there was before lockdown. I was in Riyadh and Dharan, and you just see the social changes on the street. And I probably feel them a bit more acutely as a woman. The first time I ever went to Saudi, you know, I wore traditional right. Saudi dress and a baya and a headscarf in public. And now you don't have to. So there's massive social changes taking place. And this is really the dichotomy of Mohammed bin Salman as a leader. His population is very young, aggressively young. You have women entering the workforce very quickly and excitingly so. Many of them are actually Uber drivers. The last time I was there, all of my Uber drivers were women. And at the same time, that is something the United States would like to see. But they have a lot of human rights issues. The United States has with uh, di dissents and, and critics uh, against the kingdom. And of course, there was Joe Biden right. as uh, when he was campaigning, saying he was going to make the kingdom a pariah and revealed that intel report that said Mohammed bin Salman himself signed off on the killing of Jamal Khashoggi. Is the oil prosperity filtered down to the people of Saudi Arabia? Can we say for the people it's a boom economy? Mm. We can say that, certainly so. They have done very well in terms of Aramco and these higher gas uh, oil prices. We have seen um, they're exporting an, an incredible amount of fossil fuel products. We should note that it is a very young economy and is why Mohammed bin Salman has this vision 2030. He wants to diversify. This is one of the pillars the Saudis want to talk about outside of the traditional security for oil. They want to talk about investments. They actually do want to talk about cleaner technologies. They want to make sure that their kingdom is built for the future because they have a very growing, very young population. And they do see the writing on the wall that at some point the world may be moving away towards fossil fuels, even though we're not feeling that right now. And Marie, how much is President Biden working in coordination with Olaf Scholz of Germany at a time when Nord Stream 1 and the closure, uh, the routine closure, but the uh, question around the reopening really is the dominant story and is becoming an increasing international security and an economic story, not only for Europe, but also the rest of the world? The administration has been focused on this for months. The president's uh, energy whisperer, his security advisor, Amos Hochstein, talked about this last fall. He said Europe needs to get very serious when it comes to energy security or they are likely potentially have issues in terms of conservation and potentially freezing. We have heard this from executives, the French executives of Total, EDF, telling consumers, telling businesses they need to start ratcheting back on their consumption now. The issue, of course, is they want to try to build these stockpiles in the summer because they are incredibly worried about the winter. And a lot of this, as Jonathan said at the top, comes down to what happens next week when Nord Stream 1. How much of politics is Putin willing to play with energy, given the fact that it is still the lifeblood of his economy? AMH, great to catch up. Anne-Marie on the ground. We'll hear from her all week.
just working with my producer, Jamie, to get hold of this Bank of America note. Savita Subramaniam has just obliterated <coughs> her year-end forecast on the S&P 500. 3,600 down from 4,500. This off the back of the work of Michael Gapen, who runs the economics team over at B of A mm -hmm. now, who's looking for a mild US recession starting in the second half of this year. So they come down to 3,600 from 4,500. They say that's a 25% decline. They point out that 31% is the average decline amid recessions. I'm just working through the notes, Tom, but we were looking for some downgrades, and there's a monster well, one. They're, they're going to be there. And to me, the partition when times get tough is profit. And we're going to see that with J.P. Morgan and Morgan Stanley today. The quality of their profit will be interesting. I'm fascinated to see how Morgan Stanley does. Uh, their, their wealth management margin, John, is legendarily wonderful. It'll be interesting to see if they sustain that. Lisa, your take? My take is that the big <clears throat> determinant of what makes a bull market versus a bear market or gains versus losses is what Marky Patel was talking about, which is a Federal Reserve whose hand is being forced. The data is not cooperating with them. There was a hope for the soft landing to be facilitated by a natural rollover in the inflation data, which is not happening. So how much are you going to see this be the pivot point for a lot of these downgrade revisions to a lot of the estimates? And how much is it confirmed, frankly, by the forward outlooks that we're hearing from companies themselves? Tom, you mentioned Larry McDonald a little bit earlier this morning just sent him a quick message he's going to join us so we'll try and get him on in the next hour or so we're going to his people talk to your people i've spoken to his people directly that's great to try and make that happen for you okay it's just amazing his people meaning him me personally during <laughs> yeah. the show live yeah to make this happen on whatsapp okay? you know the telegraph did a thing yesterday on you know wearing suits and ties or shorts i can see mcdonald doing that we'll ask larry about you know, that i'm, I'm not so sure him. about the shorts thing i've got thoughts on that but Maybe another day, given Have what's Have you happening. seen that, like, in London? I mean, let's be honest. London, everybody here is wearing a damn Patagonia. In London, they're at least dressing. Hey, it, Tom, Are we if, seeing shorts? I, I can't speak for London at the weekend. At the weekend, if the sun comes out, everyone's naked because they've never seen the sun before. They <laughs> behave that way. So, look, well, I've, I've got thoughts serious? on shorts and suits. I hate it. I hate it. Okay. You go with the flip-flops, though? I hate that, you know. too, and you know that as well. You get, you I know, really do. You know, I could see you doing the prep thing, mattress shorts and flip-flops in the winter. Don't get that would going. be John Farrell. Future's down. You know, we got to get you, John. I can see you with some Chody, some Chody flip-flops. Down nine-tenths. I'm going to get some, I'm gonna get some flip-flops from Chode. Shorts and flip-flops. John Farrell wore Chode flip-flops in February. And they do not belong anywhere else, okay? Are we done? Public Get service announcement. Group down. I'm pulling a tan <laughs> suit stronger. on tomorrow. I won't be here for that. This is Bloomberg. Come the downgrades in a big, big way. Equity futures negative right now, one full percentage point on the S&P on the Nasdaq 100. We're down eight or nine tenths of one percent. Take a listen to this. Bank of America forecasting a mild recession second half of this year. Savita Subramaniam taking the S&P 500 year-end price target from 4,500 down to 36, 3,600. That is one how of a price target cut on the S&P. That's your equity story. Here's your bond market picture. Twos and tens, looking at that gap between almost negative 30 basis points in the last 24 hours. Just off those levels at the moment, with the yields higher at the front end again by four basis points on a 10-year by two. It's the character of the inversion yesterday that got my attention, Lisa. This simultaneous pop higher in two-year yields and drop lower in the 10-year yield. And it's pretty clear what that bond market picture is speaking to. And just to con confirm that idea, the 30-year auction that we were talking about yesterday actually was unprecedented in the small share of bonds that dealers took down. Indirect bidders actually took down a record proportion of these notes. Basically, the demand is real. People have confidence that we're going to get back to a low inflation, low growth uh, idea. But how we're going to get there is what's changed. And it is near-term front-loaded rate hikes by the Federal Reserve. To get there, more hikes, lower growth. That's the story for the bond market. You push all this through the FX market, you get some big changes. Dolly Yen had a little look at 139 earlier, 138.94. That currency pair has had a one percentage point move again today. That's yen weakness, dollar strength. Euro dollar has new problems. Negative on the session by about a third of 1%. Tom, you can now throw Italian politics into the mix. Yeah, Stir it all up. That is a toxic recipe 
for what's going to take place in Europe. Well, I agree for Europe. That's something to focus on. And maybe that is the thermometer of what Madame Lagarde has to deal with, John. But we have moved in the last couple of days, and particularly with Bank of Canada yesterday, beyond just focusing on Europe. What's different this morning with the yen weakness is this has gone global. So, Tom, for the ECB next week, what do you think they should do? People expect 25. Uh... We're looking at the mess right now with Nord Stream 1. If I was in that news conference next week, I'd ask a really simple question. What does the rate hike today achieve? I would say... What to, does it do? I would say to Christine Lagarde, keep every bit of degrees of freedom open. She needs... It. The word she would use is optionality has to be treasured here because it's vaporizing rapidly with diminished demand, diminished economic growth. They've used two words. One is optionality, the other is gradualism. Do you lose that second word, Tom? as you look at the world around you. Uh, their political calculus is so different than, you know, Ottawa's, Ottawa's not Frankfurt. Can I go with that? I don't know where either are sure. on the map, but, you know. You ever been to Ottawa? I have never been to Ottawa. I almost went once. <laughs> I was supposed to give a speech, but it was Why too cold. Why didn't that happen? It was too cold. Too cold, so you can't Plus, I, I said I wouldn't go unless Montreal was playing the Senators. Let's hope they're not listening today. <laughs> yeah. OK. okay. Are, are we done? We're done. We're, We're very done. done. Joining us now to get us started on bank earnings, someone who's been doing this for a few years, a few cycles, Gerard Cassidy is with RBC Capital Markets. Gerard, what is the distinction as we begin with J.P. Morgan here in 12 minutes? Tom, I think what the distinction will be is the following. You're going to see some very strong net interest revenue growth from J.P. Morgan Chase and its peers due to the rise in interest rates that we've seen over the last three to six months. Second, you're also going to see a big focus on credit quality. That is the concern everybody has about the banks. That is what is weighing on bank stocks, is the concern of credit quality going into an economic slowdown and or recession. And then third, investment banking results. As you know, Tom, you've seen the numbers so far. They have been very weak this year in the investment banking business. Gerard, if we get the microphone up, there we go. Gerard, what we've heard over the last few weeks from Jamie Dimon is that this hurricane was coming. Now, I just wonder if you expect to see that in underwriting standards at all from any of these banks. John, it's going to be interesting. So his you know, forecast for a hurricane, that's going to be interesting to see if he maintains that or if he upgrades it to something more severe like a tsunami, which would not be good for the bank stocks. On the other hand, he may walk it back a little bit. However, on the underwriting specifically, I would say that the banking industry, as a result of the stress tests that they go through every year and the lessons they learned in 08, 09, underwriting standards today are much better than what we saw in the 2006 and 2007 time period. I would also suggest as... I think we just lost that, Gerard Cassidy there of RBC Capital Markets. That's sort of like... Yes, suggestions, like, Tom. Yeah, that's J.P. Morgan Security stepping in, cutting off Cassidy. Yeah, suggestions. That's what we'll that is. We'll try and get some of those suggestions, shall we? You know, let's go to the press the conferences. Hour. They have two press conferences, John. They're both going to be equally important. Earnings calls, Tom. Earnings, yeah, earnings, whatever you call them. Excuse <laughs> me. Call them a presser sorry. if you yes. want. By or all means. presser. With but, analysts. But, but, John, they're going to be really, really... They're going to be more interesting than normal, I guess is how I'd put it. I would agree with you, but that last question, Lisa, is the one that a lot of, a lot of people want to see answered. It's all well and good sitting there and having that fireside chat about the hurricane on the horizon. We want to know what's going on in the business. What's right. happening with lending? What should we read on consumers right now? How strong is this economy? Because we've heard from banks repeatedly that things are decent. And how do you actually expand in lending at a time when you're worried about consumer credit or even corporate credit in the face of recession? How do you expand some of the revenue bases of the nuts and bolts of what you do if you don't have that faith, if you think that a hurricane is coming? The expectation is investment banking and deal making is going to be a lot slower. Trading will try to plug some of that gap. But the loan creation is really my question. How much can they actually capitalize on higher rates, uh, especially in, it's not really that economic for them considering the flat yield curve. I've got a man that you can ask, if you like. Gerard Cassidy of RBC joins us right now. Gerard, I asked you that question about underwriting standards and credit and the availability of credit and what these banks are going to do through this year. Can you pick up on that again? Sure. And in fact, John, what we saw in the H8 data on credit creation, loan growth for the banking industry today is that double digit rates of growth is being driven by commercial loans and consumer lo loans. So we are seeing the banks benefit from this loan growth. And then on the underwriting, as you pointed out, John, that is a critical part in any bank and the underwriting standards we believe 
are quite uh, healthy or strong. We have to remember, because of what we went through in 2008 and 2009 and the DFAS test that was created following that period, the yeah. Federal Reserve has de-risked the banking industry's balance sheets and has pushed some of the highest risk loans into the shadow banking market. And that's where the real yeah. issues could uh, percolate should this economy really slow down over the next 12 months. Gerard Cassidy, at the University of Maine in Orono, there is a great black bear. It's a giant statue, folks. And the statue was renamed in honor of Gerard Cassidy, Var. <laughs> Var the bear. Well, VAR's the bear, and there's a lot of volatility now. You and I don't believe in VAR, Gerard, but the banks have to use VAR. Does VAR matter this time around? Value at risk on how they're measuring their losses. In, in the securities area, Tom, it does matter. In the investment banking, trading businesses, trading in particular, it does matter. Now, the banks, again, have done a very good job following 0809 in managing the, the VAR for their securities business. So it does matter. And oh. we haven't really seen it get out of hand like you saw during the financial crisis. So I would say that because of the lessons learned in the past, it's much better today. The system is uh, safer. There are still risks. I don't want to dismiss that there aren't risks, but they're just not as uh, potentially as severe as what we saw, of course, in 08, 09. And it seems like a lot of people have accepted this story, Gerard. I don't think a lot of people are looking for intense credit risk at the banks. They're not looking for severe losses. They're looking for where is the growth going to come from in a scenario where they have stripped down so much of the risk, where they aren't necessarily exposed to the upside gain in a, a sort of bull market coming out of a recession. What are you looking for in terms of areas of growth? Lisa, we're looking for the areas in traditional lending. I think what we're going to find is it's the traditional banks that are growing their loan books. And what's equally as important, and, and Tom may remember this because it's going back 15 years now, mm -hmm. um, the right side of the balance sheet, the liability side of the balance sheet finally is going to come back to be the real positive for banks. And what I mean by that is core deposits are going to be very important over the next 12 months. Over the last 15 years, it didn't matter where you received your funding because rates were so low. That is going to change. If the Fed funds rate in years from now is close to 4%, cheap consumer core deposits in Buffalo, New York are going to be more valuable than the high net worth deposits in Fairfield County, Connecticut. Are you telling us that we're not getting interest on our savings anytime soon, Gerard? Ultimately. John, I, that's that's exactly right. And what's going to happen is that the mom and pop, grandma and grandpa accounts are not going to go to Marcus for 150 basis points. They're going to stay where they are. Plus, on top of that, think of all the people that have direct deposit of their paychecks into a deposit account. Yeah. Bank of America has incredible consumer deposits, and they're going to benefit in this rising rate environment. That's why the margins, it's going to be amazing this year how to see this uh, margin growth. We haven't seen yeah. this in over 15 years. And John, this reminds me of when Cassidy was at the University of Maine. It was, you know, he was up on Mount Katahdin and he found Jeff the Black Bear. Jeff the Black Bear. And they were playing Colby College in football and Cassidy brought along this little baby bear and Can that you was the start this? of the Black Bear. Can you translate this for everyone? What are you talking about? We're talking about one of the great symbols of New England, the Black okay. Bear statue at the University of Maine, hockey dynamo that it is. Great. <laughs> well, it's good. I'm pleased you translated that. Jared, okay. thank you. Jared Cassidy of RPC Capital Markets. Jared's got something to say, but they muted his mic, Tom. So <laughs> it sounds like what they do with me. Why not? <laughs> I wish they did more of that sometimes. <laughs> thank you. JP Morgan numbers, Tom, a few minutes away. You are not getting that interest on your earnings I, anytime soon. Yeah, I will re-emphasize that we under-report the size, the scale of these enterprises. Yes, there's a recession, gloom, et cetera. These banks are ginormous, and John, they're they're wickedly profitable compared to what Gerard Cassidy remembers in the time of leverage. So big question, Tom. Lisa, why is the stock down 30%? JP Morgan's down 29% this year. Think about the start of the year, the big consensus call. Rates are going up by the banks. Look at how that's turned out. Where is their growth going to come from? I keep going back to go. that. If you can't expand in lending, if you're not necessarily benefiting from a yield curve because it's inverted, and if you're looking at a potential credit risk issue, not necessarily collapsing the bank, but just in terms of torpedoing certain profits, it's hard to get excited, and I think that's the issue. Lisa's asking the same question. You can see she's fired up about it. Where's my she interest is. on my savings? That's what Bramo <laughs> wants to know. <laughs> Absolutely. Actually, there are a couple places starting. 10 years, Tom's thinking the same thing.
Futures down 1% on the S&P. We're down 38 points. From New York, JP Morgan Earnings coming up shortly. With the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Donald Trump reportedly is looking at announcing in September that he'll run for president again. That is according to the Washington Post. The newspaper says that allies are telling the former president that announcing before the November midterm elections will drive turnout to help Republicans take over Congress. The U.S. Senate is getting closer to a deal on President Biden's economic agenda, but the state and local tax deduction issue threatens to spark a showdown amongst Democrats. Senator Joe Manchin has been negotiating with Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. Manchin says the federal deduction, popular in high-tax states known as SALT, hasn't been in the mix. That could doom the bill's prospects. And the U.S. House has passed a bill to help state and local governments set up a warning system for active shooter situations. The legislation gained new urgency after shootings in Texas, New York and Illinois. Many Republicans opposed it, calling it an encroachment on the rights of gun owners. And a new forecast says the euro area's rebound from the pandemic will be weaker than anticipated. Meanwhile, inflation will be faster because of the war in Ukraine. According to draft projections by the European Commission, GDP will likely rise 2.6% this year and 1.4% in 2023. Inflation is now seen averaging 7.6% in 2022. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts. In more than 120 countries, I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. getting some JP Morgan numbers for you. Let's start there. Revenue coming in just a little bit lighter than expected. 31.63 billion, the estimate 31.97 billion. I'll give you the breakdown and show you where some weakness is right now. Equity sales and trading revenue is where the beat was. The miss, investment banking revenue, big miss there. Fixed sales and trading revenue, big miss there. And here's a headline from JP Morgan. We have temporarily suspended share buybacks. The stock is down by 1.44% in the pre-market. It's down on the year by about 30% now, Tom. So some real misses there in the mix from yeah. J.P. Morgan. Jamie Dimon mentioning here they performed well. He mentions credit discipline. And, John, what a shock. There it is, the Fortress balance sheet front and center for Mr. Dimon. Not the story for us this morning, though, Tom. Down 3%, Lisa. <clears throat> miss, miss, miss in a lot of places. And there were some uh, misses expected or weakness expected, particularly in the investment banking, but not in the trading. And the fact that the fixed income trading actually missed estimates with revenues coming in at 4.7 billion versus 5.1 billion highlight the tenuous nature of this particularly vile, volatile area. What is going to be the message from temporarily suspending share buybacks if that was also a ballast for a lot of the value that people saw in these shares? The quarter included a $428 million net reserve build. So at first blush, if you you're looking for a hurricane and you're not sure what that hurricane might look like on the horizon, I think these numbers might speak to that. Shanali Basex had a chance to read through it in some detail. Shanali, your take on things. Yeah, fascinating here, John, because you were looking for trading to come and save the day. And even though you did see that boost in fixed income, it's not anywhere near what Wall Street was expecting. And remember, JP Morgan, with currency volatility, with fixed income volatility, they are the thousand pound gorilla in the room here. So how does that fare then for Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs and Citigroup, which were also hoping for trading to save the day. The equities beat was interesting because, as you know, Morgan Stanley is typically the leader in that business. There's a lot of question happening around on Wall Street on whether J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs are truly taking share, especially in the wake of Archegos. Remember that it feels like a long time ago. But again, J.P. Morgan has been investing in that business while you see they're cutting in other places. They were the first bank, remember, to start cutting headcount in the mortgage business. The charge-offs are also interesting, and the provisions for loan losses came in a little bit higher than Wall Street was expecting. The caution here, especially those suspension of share buybacks, will be notable and will set the tone for everybody else, uh, including the rest of corporate America. And Shanali, including the rest of the banks, and I was looking at the knee-jerk reaction in Bank of America and Citigroup, and to follow on to what you're saying, we really are seeing a knee-jerk response that this is the bellwether 
for the rest of the banking complex and beyond. How much is that accurate? How much has that been borne out in previous earnings cycles that this really has been uh, an accurate read on the tone for the rest of the season? It, it certainly is. And remember, I would also point out that J.P. Morgan and Morgan Stanley are right now the most expensive of the big banks, especially uh, when you look at it in terms of price to book. They're trading at 1.3 and 1.4, where Bank of America is barely trading at book value. Goldman Sachs, Citigroup, and Wells Fargo are below that. So if this is the bellwether, then there are major questions, Lisa, on how, how much worse it could get. The stock is down in the pre-market by 5%. Shanali, you're going to pick up on this story through the next hour when we get Morgan Stanley as well. We want to touch base with Jared Cassidy of RBC, who's had the chance also to go through some of this. Stock's down 5%. I want to go back to those words of Jamie Dimon in the last few months, Gerard, when he said a hurricane might be coming. We don't know how big it's going to be. Do you think some of this stuff speaks to that? We've got a technical connection with Joe Cassidy of RBC. I was told he was good, but apparently it's not. We can pick up on the details of this report, though. We're down 4.8 percent. And I'll go back to what I said just seconds ago, Lisa. This is a man who stood there and said in the last couple of months a hurricane might be coming. What would you do if you thought a hurricane was on the horizon and you had no idea how big it might be? You'd increase provisions, one, and you might suspend a capital return program and wait and see what the second half brings. Another way of putting this is he's putting his money where his mouth is. And some people might have said that perhaps he would come out and the actual results would show something different than perhaps a hurricane is coming. But that's not the case. His actions are confirming that they are preparing for something that is uh, more deleterious in the economy. How much does he actually see that in the underlying data versus just act in a precautionary manner? So some of this can become self-fulfilling. And Shanali, if I can bring you back in, and thanks for sticking with us. Are you going to start to see banks tighten up credit, credit standards, underwriting standards, that ultimately you end up with a self-fulfilling scenario where the banks pull back and because of that the economy pulls lower too? Yeah, I would want to point out what Jamie Dimon said even just a couple of weeks ago, that charge-offs could start to rise. I also want to point to the numbers here because the net interest income is lighter than what Wall Street was expecting. Remember, J.P. Morgan was saying that they would get a lot more with that rise in net interest income uh, because of higher interest rates. Today is going to be a huge day where where Jamie Dimon is going to be asked a lot about that conflicting force between a potential 1% <clears throat> interest rate right. hike and a, an inverted yields curve. If, if Jamie Dimon tightens lending standards, how does that pair with potentially consumers borrowing less? That home lending revenue plummeted, really, more than 20%. And card and auto was also weaker. So where is the money going to come from? Let's talk about wealth management. You mentioned Archegos and Credit Suisse, like everybody else, is going to solve all their, their inward problems by wealth management. Asset management, let's all go to Asia and talk to rich people. J.P. Morgan, assets under management were $2.7 trillion, down 8% driven by lower market levels. Okay, negative 8%, I guess, is... Is, is pretty good. How does wealth management fit in for a ginormous bank like J.P. Morgan or a more focused effort like Fortress Gorman? Yeah, and you know, we were talking about price to book. Morgan Stanley is more expensive on that on that measure than J.P. Morgan because there's an expectation that wealthier customers are going to fare this inflation. But everybody's better. going for that market, right? Everybody's Everybody going wants for that to be a wealth manager. And you saw those changes over at UBS to capture even more of the U.S. market. You're seeing also J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs. Morgan Stanley higher abroad as well because they are betting on some weakness on the European banks, hoping that they can take more clients both abroad and in the United States. However, to your point, that's not going to be a necessarily cheap endeavor to do. But I will also cite Mr. Diamond once more and say, uh, <laughs> Mr. citing Mr. Diamond, citing Mr. Bezos, saying your margins are my opportunity here. He has guided that he's been willing to spend to outperform in businesses like that because, to your point, Tom, Wealth management tends to do better in this kind of environment because yeah. those customers hold up better. Shinali, just quickly, in 20 seconds, is there a bank out there with a big capital return program with a target on its <laughs> back right now? Uh, no, there are capital return plans, and we've been guiding it for weeks here, John. It, they, people have to mute their expectations. If you're going into an economic hurricane, you need to keep money on your balance sheet. Shinali, 
Awesome to catch up. More coverage from our Wall Street correspondent, our chief Wall Street correspondent through the morning as we get more details on these earnings reports. Lisa, that's JP Morgan. Up next is Morgan Stanley, but wow, does this one set the tone early on. Absolutely, for the entire market. Interesting detail around suspension of the share buyback plan. They talk about the stress tests and how they want to get to a certain goal that were set out for them, goals that were set out for them in those stress tests, and that temporarily suspending share buybacks will allow us maximum flexibility to best serve our customers, blah, 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 blah. Yep. But it's because they want to get to those targets quicker. I mean, how much is this basically being forced on them Here's also? The, the top line from Jamie Dimon, we're prepared for whatever happens in the economy. We're taking another leg lower in this market off the back of this. We're down 1.4% yep. on the S&P 500. More still to come from New York City. This is Bloomberg. Every developed market is facing the same problems in terms of high inflation, slowing growth, declining real wages. This is going to amp up pressure on policymakers. It's going to be a tough call for the Fed, to be honest. They let the inflation genie surge out of the bottle much too rapidly with their shift to a backward-looking paradigm. It's going to be a rough road the second half of 2022. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Here comes the hurricane from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Live on TV and radio for our audience worldwide alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Brambitz. I'm Jonathan Ferrer. We're down 1.3% on the S&P. JP Morgan <clears throat> lower. TK, the earnings out 10 minutes ago. Yeah, it's important. I mean, they got some happy talk there about mobile customers up 11%, and I'll go with that. But, John, the financials here buried in the supplemental report begin to get the attention that you're going to hear at the press conference earnings calls or whatever you you want to call them return on assets over year over year from a 1.29 percent down to 0.89 percent intangible book value and john i think this really says it all about fortress uh jp morgan tangible book value is up one percent i mean this is basically a big bank flatlining you know it's that's a little harsh but flatlining uh given the tumultuous times the big headline in the last 10 minutes tom suspended the share buybacks Yes, JP absolutely. Morgan. Yeah, the yeah. stress test clearly kicking in, perhaps in a bigger way over the next 12 months, uh, given the volatility we've seen in this market. We've seen some massive <clears throat> corrections, TK. I'm going to let Allison Williams tell me this trust test matter here. I just think it's a very cautious, responsible, ginormous uh, entity. And, and frankly, John, it heats up over what we're going to see from the other banks. Lisa, the other disappointing factor in this earnings report is where you expected the strength to be trading. It didn't show up. That was, yeah, that was where people were expecting some sort of offset to the investment banking side. On a bigger level, though, this is a really negative bellwether. This is the behemoth bank coming out, girding itself for that hurricane. Again, putting their money where their mouth is in terms of what Jamie Dimon said uh, just a few months ago. And how much do we see this reflected in the rest of earnings at a time when there is so much uncertainty and people are still building leverage? I can't get over this. The debit and credit card spending still expanding rapidly as people dive further into their savings and try to basically cap the difference and keep traveling and keep spending. Are you saying you don't buy that consumer strong, consumer strong story we've been fed over the last few months? There are signs of weakness, number one. And number <clears throat> two, again, what is the potential consequence of building leverage into a downturn, especially given that that was one of the main nodes of strength was that the consumer balance sheet was healthy and strong. This to me just kind of defies logic. Stock is off the lows. We're down 2.7% on JP Morgan. We were down five. Tom, this is one piece of a much broader puzzle this morning. Cross asset yields <clears throat> over the last 24 hours. A yield curve that's deeply inverted in FX. The well, dollar a whole lot stronger. Dollar yen. At one point, I thought dollar yen waking up this morning, Tom, might strike 140. Had a little look at 139, took a visit, came back down. But we're seeing some big moves. Right now, 139.10. I mean, John, we're looking at J.P. Morgan, and I agree we need to have further scrutiny here on this major bank. And, again, it sets up the the other banks. Just, to, uh, again, the positive, the headcount, 260,000 out to 278,000. But I'm going to guess Mr. Diamond, uh, Mr. Pinto, and the rest of them, they want to know globally what's happening in the markets. And there's a new fragility this morning, John, as you see it with yen now back over over a 139 again, uh, weaker yen. And, John, it's the way the yen is weak. 
that is important. Let's get you a picture of global markets right now. Futures are negative 44. <laughs> let's call it 45 and round down. We're negative 1.2% on the S&P. We are negative 93 on the Nasdaq 100, down eight tenths of 1%. Yields a bit higher again by three basis points on a 10-year, 296. 50 in foreign exchange euro dollar basically where it was euro dollar 10013 negative a half of one percent and we keep going back to it don't we get used to 93 on wti what happened to 150 yeah. lisa 9380 on wti we're down another 2.6 percent in another time this would be a positive story because it would indicate that perhaps some inflationary pressure was coming off but right now this is demand destruction the expectation that people will not be able to spend to the same degree that they have been doing over the past few years that has just been basically confirmed that negative view by JP Morgan's earnings coming out yes their earnings were disappointing on an earnings per share level but that was probably the less concerning aspect the share buyback suspension highlights a lot of concerns alarm bells not only about the stress tests but also about the condition of the economic outlook and what banks are doing and frankly other companies to gird against that. You saw a knee-jerk reaction to other banks. Morgan Stanley is set to report any minute. Uh, those shares down by 1%. But in the Citigroup and the Bank of America, the other behemoths, you are seeing uh, an even bigger drop. At 8.30 a.m., we get the latest read on U.S. data, initial jobless claims, and U.S. June PPI. I am looking at the PPI because what we're looking at is inflation data that is only causing the Fed to double down, at least in their rhetoric, in terms of aggressive rate hikes. How much are we reaching a pivot point where people are saying the negative outcomes are looking that much more likely because the Fed is going to be aggressive and they will keep going despite the potential recession risk and the increasing likelihood. And at 11.30 a.m. following on to that, Fed Governor Chris Waller appearing with our own Michael McKee at a forum in, at the Rocky Mountain Economic Summit in Idaho, talking about perhaps what the pivot point will be for him in terms of how fast he'll go, not just this month, not just in September, but through the rest of the year as the market prices in a 3.7 percent Fed funds rate by the end of this year, John, we are bringing forward these rate hikes. They are getting more aggressive in terms of the market expectations, and that is changing some of the estimates on Wall Street. Totally with you, Bramo. I think the big conversation we've got to have is the upside risk to rates in the second half, and that's something that Jan Hatzius and the team at Goldman were speaking to yesterday. Pleased to say that joining us now is Daryl Cronk, the Chief Investment Officer for Wealth and Investment Management at Wells Fargo. Daryl, always great to catch up with you, sir. Let's just start with those numbers from JP. Your thoughts? Well, I think it's the first real indication you're seeing of both CEO confession season, right? Actually really looking at what the true impact of the earnings season that we've been kind of um, refusing to acknowledge in keeping these estimates high. And also the real impact, the first look at the real impact on what's happening with consumers at the pump, um, at the grocery store, right? The real effects of inflation and financial conditionings tightening at the warp speed that they've been tightening is going to show up in earnings. There's no place to hide on this, Jonathan. There's no place to hide, Daryl Cronk. And in that is in a given sector, there will be winners and losers, even in a bear market. What is a distinguishing feature, say with the banks, that will be a winner in a bear market versus a loser in a bear market? Well, I think for this earnings season specifically, Tom, it's a good question. I think uh, when you are over-indexed to investment banking revenue, sales and trading revenue, I think that's going to be the challenge because, as we know all too well, the first half of the year and in particularly the acute negative returns for both equities and fixed income markets in the second quarter are just going to make those returns abysmal, right, by any means. The traditional lending side, the consumer side, the small business side, has actually shown that it's been a little bit more resilient, although I think we're in the early stages of seeing some deterioration there. It just probably isn't going to show up as acutely in Q2. We need to watch for that in the second half of the year. Daryl, based on the granular data, the real-time data, how much is J.P. Morgan accentuating something that we're seeing more broadly versus perhaps a unique story in itself with some specific misses and a stress test that really had some extreme scenarios? Uh, and, and that's sort of important given the market action we have right now. It is really important, Lisa. And, and the point is, um, I, I think it is a, a telltale sign of something more broadly. I don't think it's idiosyncratic to them. I mean, if you just think about how rapidly the conditions have changed in the last month, I was on a few weeks ago, we were positive 14 basis points on two to 10 spreads. Today, we're minus 23. A few weeks ago, literally uh, a month ago, oil was $123 a barrel. Today, it's 94. Now, that helps the consumer. The dollar is up another 4 to 5% just in the last month, right? Conditions are rapidly changing in front of our eyes. And I don't, I, I'm not sure people have 
kind of latched onto that and what it means for the second half. Given that, Daryl, I'd love your take on the idea that we're seeing a really rapid build in credit card loans. And we saw that from Jamie Dimon in his comments about credit card spending and debit. How much does this indicate a challenge to the strong consumer balance sheet narrative? Yeah, I think you guys hit it on the head earlier. Um, I think the market has been sold a little bit of a bill of goods on how strong the consumer is. Let's admit that you know the, the support mechanisms through the stimulus of the pandemic really helped the consumer. There was large cash balances. Those cash balances are gone now. The savings rates have eroded. Um, what's interesting, and you raise an excellent point, which is if you look at the Fed's data on consumer spending and credit card um, outstandings, right, uh, increases there. We've seen some of the largest increases in credit card outstanding in the last couple of months that we've ever seen on record since we've been keeping data. That's an ominous sign heading into a world where the economy is slowing, financial conditions are, are slow or contracting, demand destruction is happening. And yet, to your point, the consumer is having to draw on you know, revolving lines of credit in order to meet those spending needs at the pump and the grocery store. Daryl, awesome to get your views on things. A lot happening this morning. Daryl Cronk there of Wells Fargo. Bank of America making moves. Michael Gapen arrives at the economics team, forecasts a mild recession this year. Savita Subramanian comes out and downgrades the outlook for equities. Their year-end forecast goes from 4,500 all the way down to 36. This just comes in from the rates team, just catching up with the team at Bank of America right now. We revise our U.S. rate forecast lower following the shift to a recession call. They've got the 10-year end in 22 at 275, end in 23 at 250. And here's something that jumped off the page in the PDF to me. One important shift in the U.S. rate view is on QT. Our base case is for the Fed to cease QT with the first rate cut in September 23. There's some big calls for the next 12 months in there, Tom. Well, there are big calls around around the big movements we're seeing, and I I'll, I will say the floodgates were open yesterday by Bank of Canada. Let me make clear, John, that shocked me, and I believe it shocked everybody else in Wall Street. And that happens in any kind of a cycle and any kind of a set of historic events. There are these one-offs, these one announcements where you go, wow, I remember that. We had one of those yesterday, which is where you're going to start to see these seismic changes. Lisa Morgan Stanley, up next. Yeah, and how much do they confirm the view that we heard from J.P. Morgan, especially because they're that much more dependent on the investment banking and the trading sides? Uh, uh, this is a bleak out uh, a moment, and a lot of people are changing their outlooks as a result. Unreal stuff coming across the Bloomberg right now. Futures down 1.3 on the S&P 500. Yields up a couple of basis points on a 10-year. And JP Morgan, where's JP Morgan this morning off the back of this? We were down about 5% on the stock. I'll get the stock up on my Bloomberg terminal for you. This is what we look like right now. We're down by three percentage points. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishika Gupta. Officials at the Federal Reserve may debate a historic 1% point rate hike later this month. Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bostic told reporters that everything is in play after U.S. consumer prices rose a faster than expected 9.1% in the year through June. Investors bet the Fed is more than likely to hike rates by 100 basis points at the next meeting. Donald Trump reportedly is looking at announcing in September that he'll run for president again. That's according to the Washington Post. The newspaper says that allies are telling the former president that announcing before the November midterm elections will drive turnout to help Republicans take over Congress. In Israel, President Biden and Prime Minister Yair Lapid discussed regional security and Iran in their meeting today. Afterwards, Lapid said he wanted to make sure that there were no, would be no nuclear Iran, a sentiment that the president echoed. President Biden has said he remains committed to reviving the 2015 agreement that sought to limit Iran's nuclear activities. In the UK, another round of Conservative Party balloting is set for today in the process that will determine the next Prime Minister. The field of candidates has now been cut to six. Former Chancellor Rishi Sunak and Trade Minister Penny Morden have emerged as the frontrunners. At least one member of the field will be knocked out after today's vote. And there is another big ca name casualty from the true trillion dollar cryptocurrency crash. Crypto lender Celsius Network has filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection in New York. Celsius had amassed more than $20 billion in assets by offering interest rates as high as 18% to depositors. It halted withdrawals last month in the midst of a panic run by clients. 
Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Inflation is too high, but we've started to see, especially in commodities, prices come down. And we've seen that in terms of oil and gas, but also in other commodities as well. They haven't come down enough. We want them to keep coming down. And we're going to keep taking actions to make sure that on things like prescription drugs, people are paying less going forward. That was Wally Adeyemo there, the U.S. Treasury Deputy Secretary from New York City this morning. Good morning. Here's your price action. We're lower by 1.25 percent <clears throat> on ESP. We're down about 48. On the Nasdaq 100, we're down nine tenths of one percent. We're down one. Zero one. Yields look like this, up three basis points, 295.95. Crude lower again by 2.9%, 93.50. Bit of euro weakness out there. Let's just call it parity. I'm not going to argue over 0 0.0014 nice. with you. We're at 1.0014 nice. right now. We're down a half of 1%. Dollar yen having a look at 139 and maybe more. Looking at 140 potentially. Dollar strength, the big story this morning. And in the mix... JP Morgan coming out a little bit earlier, about 40 minutes ago now. The stock recovering a little bit off session lows was down 5%. It's now down just two. A few misses in the mix here, Lisa, and then suspending the share buyback program. Not exactly helping things out either. No, and this really is a broader macro story. That's how it's being treated in the market. We saw new, uh, new highs on DXY, at least going back more than a decade. We're taking a look right now at an environment that is shifting very rapidly. The fact that JP Morgan, in response, once the stress test said we need to batten down the hatches, prepare for the hurricane, and keep our balance sheet really solid, tells you a lot. TK, what's your take this morning? My take is this. It's a time for a sea change. We see it in the markets, and frankly, I think we're going to hear it from James Diamond and his team uh, today. John, Dennis Weatherstone was one of my heroes. This guy was a British guy who invented modern banking. There's no other way to put it. He's the one that took J.P. Morgan from the stodgy white shoe bank and brought him into the modern age. And he's the one that said, what risk are we taking? And Mr. Diamond has to pick this up now in these challenging times. And you see a year-over-year -year VAR moving from, I think it's a 40 statistic, out to 54, I believe, uh, in the statement. Chanali's nodding her head, so I think I'm somewhat close here. But, John, the value at risk is not to be ignored as Mr. Diamond tackles this ginormous bank amid these market challenges. Is that your gauge for whether you're right or wrong? You look out the corner of your eye and see if Shanali's smiling. Yeah, it's like the Bra we got the Shanali cam. It's like the Bramo cam, but it's a Shanali cam. Can we get the Shanali mic she's up? She's on the so phone talking with all the hitters on Wall Street, and she's going like this. And, Let's you know. do that now. Shanali, there's a question that I've been asked this morning, and I wonder if you can answer it for some people in the audience. This decision to suspend the share buyback, mm -hmm. How much of this is a Fed that spooked, looking yeah. at the stress test and telling banks, we're going to have some problems here potentially, get ready for them? I think what's interesting is you have both the Federal Reserve worrying about the consumer credit and um, you have Jamie Dimon also guiding that charge-offs can really rise into the billions in a, in a year. You are seeing start-offs, uh, charge-offs start to rise here. But you know what's interesting, to Tom's point, you do have a little bit of strain here when you're looking both at the institutional side and the consumer side. And that's also concerning, John. When you look at that value at risk, actually the biggest jump was in fixed income. These are supposed to be safe steady markets. And JP Morgan is a humongous intermediary at a time when liquidity is drying up. So you have to worry about that underlying strain, as well as what's happening on the consumer side very rapidly. John, I want to pick up on the point that you were talking about <clears throat> with what the uh, Fed is worried about. And I think Neil Dutta said it perfectly just a few moments ago on Twitter. He said, behind door number one, the Fed raises rates enough to bring inflation down, but pushes the economy into recession. Behind door number two, the Fed fails to tighten enough and inflation expectations increase. When faced with this decision, the Fed chose <clears throat> number one, hands down. Yeah. And that is the reason why it is a pivot point for this market as they look to a greater chance of recession. The tail risk has become the base case. And the base case is now a mild recession. Now, we can have a discussion about how shallow or how long that recession will be for, but the ultimate base case is now that we get one, potentially in the second half, and Bank of America are on board with that. And, Tom, that's why you see a sea change from B of A this morning. At the epicenter well, of that research house at the moment yeah. is a call from Michael Gapen for a recession later this year. That means Savita Subramanian of B of A comes out, slashes the outlook for equities. No recovery there, 4,500 down to 3,600. Then you've got Mark Cabana on the team 
over at the rate side of the business, Tom, basically saying the 10 year, year end, 275. Next year, 250. I, 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 right now, yeah. 296. John, I think you're going to see a lot more of this. And again, off of 100 beefs from Bank of Canada, it's a reset here. And, and I want to get very granular, John, on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday here. And you see it within the tension of JP Morgan. Shanali, I mean, we got the Shanali cam out here. <laughs> and she's saying you got to work from Halls here. Nobody's relaxing here, Shanali Bassick. They're going to work from the hand. They're going to work on their holidays, et cetera. But isn't the age-old bank solution to cut costs? I mean, that's that's how you do this. It's the oldest story in the world, John. Yeah. Over higher and then over... This John, uh, I'm Tom. Sorry about that. Okay, yes, continue. over, over higher and then start to fire. And you are starting to see that happening at the more consumer-focused businesses. You're seeing it over in the mortgage business. But then what happens now to those investment banking businesses? Guys, it <clears> wasn't just a little light on the figures. It was hundreds of millions of dollars worth of a miss. When you look at even debt underwriting, which is now about $700 million or so, that was inking more than a billion dollars for JP Morgan just a couple of quarters ago. So the fates change very quickly here. And you've got to wonder what happens to talent in that kind of environment. John, I'm fascinated what Morgan Stanley does. What is it, John, in 30 minutes or 15 minutes? In the next 30 more? minutes. Who knows, Tom? Folks, yes, sure. For, for Global Wall Street, you've got to stay on this. This is a different JP Morgan report. And all of a sudden, I'm fascinated how Citigroup and Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, and the others do. A couple of things to pick up on then, Tom. In the next 30 minutes, we should hear at some point from Mr. Gorman and Morgan Stanley. Should hear from the president too, Tom. We've been waiting for that press conference with the Prime Minister of Israel, set to take place at the Waldorf Astoria in Jerusalem, Israel. <coughs> Tom, that was set to start about 23 minutes ago. As you can see right now, still two empty podiums. So we wait. Yeah, and it's all being choreographed very carefully here. And again, John, I can't emphasize enough the history here. I, I, I believe it's today. There's so much going on here. My head spinning of a president traveling to Jeddah on the Red Sea in Saudi Arabia on Air Force One from Israel. Uh, in my youth, John, I could not imagine that. Next 60 minutes is busy. You will get numbers from Morgan Stanley. You will potentially hear from the president momentarily. At 8.30 Eastern, you'll get PPI, is it, Lisa, and jobless claims yep. as well. And then Governor Waller a little bit later with Mike McKee. Talk about busy. Yeah, talk about busy, especially with the jobless claims. We didn't talk as much about that, but this is also the big wild card. Could you see those jobless claims start to pick up in a big way? Not now, but perhaps in a couple of months when some of the areas that have built up capacity to respond to a sudden surge in demand have to suddenly cut back because suddenly they have overcapacity. We saw this with Walmart, with Target. How much is that going to create some pretty big swings in those unemployment figures? Starts with hiring intentions, doesn't it? You saw that with Google. Correct. They alluded to that you might see that in job openings a little bit more over the next several months and then it's absolute <clears throat> job cuts as well and that can happen pretty quickly lisa well, that's the reason why I'm wondering if there is going to be some sort of a tipping point there. And we talk about Delta, for example, not wanting to build up capacity even in the face of incredible demand because they are worried about just that, about being caught on the other side wrong-footed with overcapacity. And that, I think, is going to be, be a very choppy moment for I, the Fed to deal with. John, to, to what Savita said, yeah, people get sorted out in bear markets. You know, it's Buffett and the water flowing out. Who's got the bathing suit on kind of? I think people are going to sort out here, given what we're doing and where we're moving to the profit makers and the non-profit makers. Do you know what I'd love to see? Lisa interview Ed Bastian of Delta, because Ramo loves to bring that up. <laughs> You've got things to say. About She's you. got things to say. Look, we're running out of time. We have. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. <laughs> Live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Waiting for numbers from Morgan Stanley. Going into that, here's your price action. Equities down by 1.3% on the S&P on the NASDAQ. Lower by nine-tenths of 1%. Call it one full percentage point lower. Here are the numbers from Morgan Stanley. Net revenue, $13.1 billion. The estimate, 13.33. Second quarter EPS comes in at 139. Let's get you some sales and trading revenue numbers. That comes in at 2.96 billion. The estimate, 2.94 billion. So basically in line there. Fixed sales and trading revenue, 2.5 billion, the estimate 2.16. So an upside surprise there. Wealth management, net revenue 5.75 billion, the estimate 5.81. I suppose you can call that basically in line as well. <coughs> looking at some of the numbers from Morgan Stanley, looking at the stock down by a little more than 3%. Tom, what do you see? 
Uh, I see a different story than J.P. Morgan. It's much more focused, and I, I, I think I would suggest it as wealth management to the rescue on first uh, blush. I just don't see the agony I saw immediately from J.P. Morgan. I'll be honest, the PowerPoint coming out moments ago, i got to dive into the PowerPoint, John. Talk Investment about, our, banking talk about AC Milan football while I look at this. $1.07 billion. I'll just keep going through the numbers, Tom, against an estimate of... Uh 1.27 billion. Shanali can take a look at this now too. Shanali, your take on things. Yeah, a few things here, John. One, you do have them beat on equities and fixed income, which is a strong showing from Morgan Stanley's trading desk. But remember also, you have JP Morgan bringing in more than $3 billion worth of equities trading revenue. So that is a stunning uh, defeat, actually, for what is normally the biggest equities trading shop on Wall Street. But to Tom's point also, yes, wealth management to the rescue. You have net interest income coming in higher than expectations over at Morgan Stanley, we had talked about this before, the fact that the wealthier consumer may weather both the rising interest rate environment as well as the inflationary environment better than those who are not earning as much. Uh, it is kind of as simple as that. Mr. Gorman, this line will resonate with pretty much everyone in this market year to date. More market volatile environment than we've seen for some time. I think we all agree with that particular take on things. Alison Williams joins us of Bloomberg Intelligence. Alison, I want your take on things, please. Compare and contrast what we got from Morgan Stanley against JP Morgan. So I think uh, the big differentiator this quarter uh, might be capital. Um, you know, so Morgan Stanley has very healthy excess capital for JP Morgan and some and some of the other big banks. You know, they're feeling it from both sides. They're pressured by some of the bond valuations on their actual capital ratio, and then their uh, requirements are going up. And that was sort of the big news that we got a few weeks ago that JP Morgan, Citibank America, requirements going up. So JP Morgan suspending their buybacks today. We don't think that's a surprise. We think that's prudent. Um, but perhaps um, might have been surprising for some. In terms of the trading and fees, uh, you know, one thing I'll point out on J.P. Morgan, they had a big miss on fees, but that was a leveraged loan write down. Morgan Stanley may also have that, and it just might be sort of in another business line. Um, equities trading uh, about in line for Morgan Stanley. That was a big surprise. So interesting that J.P. Uh, Morgan Stanley is the biggest in equities trading, and there's this softer than J.P. Morgan, and the reverse is true on the fixed income trading side. The stock, Morgan Stanley, down by 2.5%. We'll keep working our way through these numbers from Morgan Stanley. A couple of things happening at the same time. The President of the United States, alongside the Israeli Prime Minister in Jerusalem, Israel, at the Waldorf Astoria. They'll be taking place, they'll be taking part in a news conference conducted right now. Any headlines, of course, will bring them to you. We want to stay on top of the bank story for you here on Wall Street, with equities down about 1.3% on ESP. Lisa Morgan Stanley, of course, not JP Morgan, and there are some big differences between the numbers this morning. Yeah, and you do see some more strength in the Morgan Stanley numbers, even though they missed on a headline figure. It is notable the different profile of these two banks, and I keep going back to that. This is more of a traditional Wall Street bank, more in line with Goldman Sachs. How much are those banks going to actually do better than some of those that that are more exposed to the consumer. And I do wonder, and I'd love, Allison, you to weigh in on this, how much are the consumer-facing banks, the JP Morgan, the Citigroup, the Bank of America, is much more exposed to downside surprise right now than those purely focused on the bread and butter of Wall Street? I think that's right, because, um, you know, if, if you think about it, net interest income is, is strong for all those lenders, but that's sort of been a factor driving the stocks uh, since last fall. And this year, really, the turn has been more towards the other side of things, the, the credit hit loss provisions. We did see a reserve build at JP Morgan. It was a little bit more than people thought. Um, but that's going to be in focus for all the traditional lenders, whereas uh, Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs that are more focused on trading in the capital markets units um, should, should benefit more from that volatility. Goldman, however, I should note, we do expect to see sort of a big increase in their provision. Those estimates have been rising. It's just yeah. that as a percentage of their business, um, less exposure. Uh, Allison, on the back end of it, they've got some dividend lift here and also a share, uh, a pretty general share buyback redo uh, they're going to do. Allison, I want you to paint for our audiences, plural, those that are fancy global Wall Street and those less so, the absolute miracle of an unadjusted wealth management pre-tax margin of 28.2%. To me, that margin is a near act of God. How did they do that? How do they make that so damn profitable? Higher interest rates. So if you think about the wealth and asset management business, the negative is that 
asset values are going down, right? So that means lower fees, but higher rates are a boost uh, to the wealth managers, and especially Morgan Stanley with their acquisition of E-Trade really getting a lift there. And I, I just, I really, I really can't say enough about it. And what, and what I see, Allison, worldwide is everybody's trying to copy James Gorman. Am I right about that? Wealth management, I, uh, James Gorman has, is sort of an active buyer, but I would say, you know, UBS and Credit Suisse, um, Credit Suisse tilting more towards it. UBS really, I think that they've been the story for a really long time. Um, but in general, all the banks globally, uh, to your point, trying to increase their exposure to this business. Keep in mind that this isn't just uh, a, a cyclical help from higher rates, but the long-term story, long story in terms of wealth creation, especially in Asia, is one of the few secular growth stories in financial services globally. Morgan Stanley down a little more than 1% in the pre-market now. We're down by 27 on JP Morgan. Shanali, we've got a decent insight now across a range of businesses on Wall Street from two names, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan. As we set things up now for Bank of America, for Goldman, for Citi, what do you see? Yeah, a few things here. Boy, is that trading environment competitive when you look at what the setup is for Goldman Sachs. They have to beat on fixed income. They have to beat on equities here. You saw JP Morgan just blow it out of the water compared to um, Morgan Stanley. Uh, for the, you know, I don't remember the last time JP Morgan beat them uh, in a quarter on equities. And Morgan Stanley as well, gaining share in fixed income. A few years ago, John, it was unheard of for them to be making more than $2 billion in a fixed income trading business. So uh, that and then, of course, also the pressures. You have asset managers also down meaningfully in terms of revenue over at Morgan Stanley. Both J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs, they are some of the biggest asset managers in the world. It is not immaterial uh, if you do see declines in those businesses, even with, as Tom was saying, those blowout figures uh, in wealth management beating on pre-tax margin when you exclude those integrated relation, uh, related expenses here. Of course, Goldman Sachs wants to take some of that crown in wealth management as well. There is the parlor game and the horse race of who gets what business. There's a bigger story that's trickling out into markets as we see the dollar ascendant taking another leg higher on the heels of some of these reports because there is a macro wager in holding back share buybacks and really uh, building some of the credit loss Reserves. And I wonder, Shanali, if you're expecting to hear similar stories from the likes of the Wells Fargo's and the Citigroup's and the Bank of America's, whether they are positioned for a much more difficult next couple of months, simply because they are that much more exposed to any potential recession bets. Yes. And even a couple of weeks ago, before even that macro environment got even tougher, you started to hear them mute expectations. Wells Fargo will be extraordinarily interesting, given their tie to the U.S. consumer and the mortgage market. Bank of America has been guiding that the consumer is steady, but will they share the same concerns about charge-offs that you're seeing over at J.P. Morgan? Remember, I have to say also valuation here. Morgan Stanley is committing to buying back $20 billion worth of stock while J.P. Morgan is suspending their buybacks, but Morgan Stanley is also more expensive relative uh, to its book value when you look at the trading. And all mm -hmm. of these businesses are still very, very volatile and subject to the macro environment. Uh, Allison Williams, I'm looking at headcount. J.P. Morgan, I believe, was a 260,000 number. Morgan Stanley, smaller, 72,000 a year ago, out to 78,000 now. Who are they hiring? I think, I think in general, the hiring we're going to see this quarter um, really relates to some of the some of the campus hires coming on. You know, for Morgan Stanley, probably the bigger story, um, which I think Bloomberg has has reported on, is mortgage banking. That's a business where we expect to see headcount coming down. Um, in general, again, you pointed to the, the the big employee base of J.P. Morgan versus Morgan Stanley. Keep in mind uh, the the branches that they have that really sort of fuels that higher staffing. That's a long-term story in terms of resizing those branches and, and becoming more dig digital and the like. I would say, um, you know, the one thing that we're focused on as well this quarter with some of these global investment banks is the, the compensation pressure and what's happening with the investment banking headcount, because that's really where we saw a lot of pressure coming into this year. Record IPOs last year, record M&A. Um, obviously, that is not the story uh, this quarter. And as we look to the second half and we listen for investment banking pipelines and what's happening with execution, uh, you know, we think there could be a little bit more softness there. It's a very different year 
Alison Williams, thank you. Alongside Shanali Vassa, we'll catch up with the two of them over the next week as we work our way through Wall Street earnings. Futures down by 1.4 percent. We'll push this forward now to a conversation about the economic data in America. 8.30 Eastern time, PPI data, factory gate, inflation pressure, all of that. Jobless claims we'll be talking about too. Just want to take us to Europe just for a moment. Take a listen to this for a headline from President Macron of France. We're saying we have to prepare for the possible cutoff of Russian gas and saying that citizens and companies will need to reduce energy use. Tom, Europe, front and center of a global recession call that is yes. quickly becoming consensus. And I would say, John, that's still true even with the EM upset today. So Badger App is going to join us shortly, the head of US rate strategy at SockGen, off the back of a monster upside surprise on inflation in America. Futures down 1.4% on ESP from New York City with Tom Keane and Lisa Brambitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. The US Senate is getting closer to a deal on President Biden's economic agenda, but the state and local tax deduction issue threatens to spark a showdown amongst Democrats. Senator Joe Manchin has been negotiating with Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. Manchin says the federal deduction, popular in high-tax states known as SALT, hasn't been in the mix. That could doom the bill's prospects. And the U.S. House has passed a bill to help state and local governments set up a warning system for active shooter situations. The legislation gained new urgency after shootings in Texas, New York and Illinois. Many Republicans opposed it, calling it an encroachment on the rights of gun owners. A new forecast says the euro area's rebound from the pandemic will be weaker than anticipated. Meanwhile, inflation will be faster because of the war in Ukraine. According to draft projections by the European Commission, GDP is likely to rise 2.6% this year and 1.4% in 2023. Inflation is now seen averaging 7.6% in 2022. Amazon has moved a step closer to settle two European Union antitrust investigations. The cases have to do with how the e-commerce giant uses rivals, sales data and whether it unfairly favours its own products. The European Commission is now asking Amazon competitors for feedback on a proposed settlement. Amazon says it's engaged constructively with the EC. And Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing has raised its revenue forecast, but the predominant manufacturer of advanced semiconductors warned it will trim spending on expansion by as much as 9% from initial projections. That reflects uncertainty about electronics demand in the face of a possible recession. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. If they need another 75 in July and three more 75 rate hikes uh, by the end of the year, I, I think they'd be willing to do it. Do I think that's the appropriate pathway? Absolutely not. But I, I think in order to maintain credibility and try at least and get some sort of, of relief from prices, th their hands are tied. Who says one data point doesn't change anything? 9.1% shook things up big time yesterday. From New York City this morning, good morning. Futures down by 1.4% on the S&P. Futures down on the Nasdaq by one full percentage point. Yields in a single basis point. Curve inversion, the story. We'll pick up on that in a moment. I want to talk about Italy too. Do not take your eyes off what's happening in Europe. Your 10-year in Italy up 20 basis points. Your two-year up 25. The prospect of this government led by Draghi to collapse. You've got Macron speaking like this just moments ago in a TV interview in France. The French president saying that we have to prepare for a possible cutoff of Russian gas. Citizens and companies will need to reduce energy use. Some of this climax in next week, Tom. Nord Stream 1, of <laughs> course, down for maintenance. That should come back on on Thursday. We'll find out how much gas actually flows through Nord Stream 1. And then the ECB has got to somehow make a rate call. I've got no idea <clears throat> how they're going to do that. 7.48 Wall Street time and some real movement in the market, John. I want to notice further curve inversion. I don't believe we're through lows, but I'm, I'm sorry, negative 27. You know, we're halfway to Priya Misra. In what, four days? I mean, yes, she said negative 40 and, and there maybe we are. lower. And I'm also looking, I'm on the parity watch on Euro. We're still not through that 1.00 uh, one run. John, I, I still think the American audience, including a dummy like me, needs to understand the stress of Mr. Macron. Rotterdam coal is up 710% off a moving average study back two years, I believe it is. 
Rotterdam coal, John, is up 103% since the Ukraine invasion. I'd throw in the stress of Chancellor Schultz as well and Prime Minister Draghi yeah. across the board. For every European leader, a tough winter is the base case for so many people. Correlations in place here with negative 52 on futures. A VIX out of stick, 28.06. Sobrano Rajapa now with Sakja and, uh, joining us here. What is the correlation that matters to you right now, Sobrata? What is the relationship not only in rates but outside rates for you? Well, I mean, everything is a correlated market, right? I mean, the, the bond yields are all very correlated. What's happening in Europe is definitely impacting uh, what's happening in the in the U.S. Uh, inflation is correlated. It's a, it's a global phenomena. Uh, but what we're really seeing right now is sort of a, a rapid slow motion, if you will, where in the U.S. you're seeing the steady rise in inflation prints, the Fed acting aggressively as predicted, and then the uh, very sharp inversion of the, of the yield curve because of that. And the market's starting to price in a much higher probability of a recession. That leading to potentially, uh, you know, Fed funds rate peaking around three and a quarter, three and a half to uh, three point seven five percent and then cuts being priced in for next year. So this is all very much what you would expect would happen in a, a scenario like this where the Fed is very aggressive. Um, as far as uh, Europe is concerned and the ECB is concerned, they're in a much tougher spot, like you pointed out. You're looking at, uh, you know, very high inflation, headline inflation because of, of higher energy costs, higher oil prices, potential rationing. But then on the other hand, they have to be concerned about growth as well, because if there is a shutdown of, of Nord Stream 1, that's going to lead to a significantly sharp uh, decline in growth. So policy then becomes a lot more tricky than it is in the US. We need to be building up gas storage in Germany. Apparently right now we're working it down. This is really problematic. So Badger, more broadly for the bond market, I'm trying to work out what the anchor of global rates will be. Over the last 20 years, it was Japan, then it was Japan and the ECB and Europe and the bond market. And now there are doubts about the policy at the BOJ. Complete unknown when it comes to the European debt market. I've got no idea how you forecast European debt yields at the moment, Sabadra. How do you come up with the Treasury call as you think about the global fixed income universe? So uh, to me at this point, uh, the anchor is, is the Treasury market because things in the U.S. are much more predictable, like you pointed out, than in other uh, jurisdictions. Uh, the, you know, Bank of Japan, you have, they have yield curve control. So in some respects, the long end is going to remain somewhat pegged, but there's a lot of pressure on the currency side of the equation. So at some point, they're going to have to, you know, move away from the peg uh, in, in Japan. So for me, what I'm really anchoring uh, are rate forecasts is on, on, on the 10 year and, uh, you know, trajectory, the trajectory for growth over the next you know, couple of years. Uh, and that's really where I think that it's going to be very difficult for 10 yields to rise meaningfully from here on given the fact that growth is poised to slow down quite meaningfully over the next year uh, with the, the Fed expeditiously hiking rates uh, over, the, over the next you know, three to six months. Subhadra, let's take that a step further and build on what Bank of America did, where they downgraded their forecast for the yield uh, differential and the, this sort of the baseline yields for 10-year and 30-year treasuries at year end and even next year. How low, and have you been revising even lower your expectations for those yields based on the deteriorating macroeconomic backdrop? So our view for, uh, for, the, for treasuries is that 10 yields will peak sometime in the second or third quarter. We might have already peaked. And then after that, we have a very steady trajectory of yields going lower from, from here on after the third quarter, perhaps ending around you know, two and a quarter to two and a half percent by the middle of next year. So that's kind of the trajectory we're looking at. It is quite a dramatic move uh, lower in, in yields from where we are right now. But it's all about you know, the trajectory for, for growth after the Fed has addressed its uh, it's, uh, you know, raised rates and address the inflation problem, if you will. How much is this also hinged on the idea that the Fed will not be able to shrink its balance sheet materially beyond perhaps uh, just the middle of next year because they will have to backtrack in the face of volatility, in the face of recession? Yeah, that's a very good question because the whole policy uh, framework gets very, very tricky this time around, given the fact that, you know, after September, the Fed's balance sheet is going to decline at around 95 billion a month. So that's a very rapid pace of balance sheet unwind starting as, as early as, as September. So, you know, I think my view is that the Fed might be able to raise rates maybe to get to 
uh, three and a quarter, three and a half percent by the end of the year. But then you're going to see this, this, uh, the balance sheet runoff act as a, as a secondary, second order effect tightening financial conditions as well. So it's going to be, it's yet to be seen if they're going to be able to continue to run off their balance sheet after the middle of next year, given the fact that they're going to potentially have to cut rates uh, if the economy slows down meaningfully. Sabadra, awesome to get your views. What a morning for it. What a 24 hours. Sabadra Japper of Sogchen. What a year. It's been, what, a few years, I'm sure, some of you screaming at the TV and radio as I say those words. Looking at these moves in this market, once again, we're seeing a simultaneous shift lower in a 10-year yield and a shift higher in a two-year yield. And what you've got is a much more inverted yield curve. The yield curve now deeply, deeply inverted, going back to 2,000 kind of levels, Tom, twos, tens, through oh. 25 basis <clears throat> points. And this idea that the Fed keeps going, and as they do, growth expectations keep come in lower. Yeah, I, I had a banner out earlier, John. I don't think I've got it here now. But again, we have to say how rare this is. And John, for the first time, I can agree with you that the word deep is in order on inversion. And I put that as a quarter of a percent differential, which is 25 basis points. We're now through that negative 26 basis points. This is like herding cats this morning. March 89, August 2000. Futures down 1.4% on the S&P on the NASDAQ. We're down one full percentage point from New York. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. all comes back to this inflation story. The Fed hiking rates can only have so much of an effect on bringing price pressures down. That is their key objective, getting that price stability. Globalization is fantastic on the upside. It has the same downside effect. Everyone slows together. There's no question there's going to have to be some pain here to deal with the problem. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keen on radio and television after J.P. Morgan and Morgan Stanley report market turmoil. And, John, we saw it in those earnings reports. J.P. Morgan is preparing for tougher times. And I would say, I would argue, many people would. This market is adjusting to that reality as well. You see that for the yield curve, two-year yields higher, the 10-year yield is lower. You see it in the commodity market, too. I think this isn't being covered enough. The breakdown in copper, down another 1.3%. Yes, yes, yes. The breakdown in crude, WTI, down another two percentage points. 93 handle a little bit earlier this morning. All of a sudden, Tom, the tail risk becomes the base case. And what's so, recession. Impor what's so important here, John, is we think as hard as we can, and we've got equities, bonds, currencies, commodities, all of our wonderful guests in front of it. You had Jean Bovin, I believe, John, yesterday. I can't remember. Expect the unexpected. Bank of Canada changed this market. New regime. That's what Jean Bovin is looking for. He expects that to come with high volatility, perhaps lower returns, but ultimately higher interest rates and stickier inflation. That's what it comes down to off the back of the report yesterday. Do you look at that report as evidence that we've seen the worst of this? Energy is going to fade. That headline number is going to come down. Or do you look at that report as evidence that this is going to be stickier? broader, and this Fed's going to have to go a whole lot higher for a whole lot longer. I mentioned Rotterdam Coal. I looked at Netherlands natural gas, and there's any number of tensions we can focus on, folks. Let's not turn this into a lecture, but John, Europe is still very visible. Without a doubt. Let's just call it parity on euro dollar. That's not the new development. Fair, yeah. Here's the new development. In the Italian bond market this morning, yields are breaking out, spreads are wider, and we need to talk about the why. The prospect of the Italian government collapses. We go into next week with Nord Stream 1 down for maintenance, set to reopen, and a complete unknown as to how much gas is going to come through that pipeline well, through the rest of this year. And European leaders coming out this morning, President Macron saying citizens and companies will need to reduce energy use. That is the dire straits that Europe finds itself in this year. In this hour, Lawrence McDonald will join us. I can't say enough uh, uh, about this. Lisa Abramowitz, Larry McDonald is, is really, really focused on emerging markets. I don't think Italy's an EM, but it, it's got those characteristics, Lisa, that you see in Egypt and others. Yeah, although I wonder if that's going to be the story or if it's going to be continuation of Europe really dragging down the rest of the world and acting very EM-like in terms of how volatile some of the 
the inflation backdrop is. I just want to build on this idea yeah. of the gas issue. In addition to what we heard from Emmanuel and Macron, the fact that German gas storage levels are falling before we get into those peak usage months at a time when people are worried about the gas supplies being cut off right. really raised the specter of Germany coming out with something similar than, as Emmanuel Macron and saying, stop using so much, put on a sweater, you know, keep temperatures uh, at this level. Uh, right now, it's two ten spread, negative 27 basis points. In, in honor of Alan Greenspan and a measured Fed, John has a measured headline. Andrew Hollenhorst from City. Here's the change. We now see a 100 basis point policy rate increase at this month's Fed meeting as the most likely outcome. They published just moments ago. In June, the committee showed it will react to each monthly meeting, each inflation reading. We now expect policy rates to reach 4% by the end of 2022. So here's the call from City, I'll repeat it. 100 basis points this month from the FOMC and policy rates to reach 4% by the end of 2022. And let me remind you something a few months ago, when City came out with that call for a 50 basis point hike, then another, then another, then another, a lot of people laughed and pushed back. Then it became the base case about a month later. And then things went even further. So this city called this morning, Tom, 100 basis points. Worth remembering that the two banks that are now calling for this, Nomura and City, they've been out front on this tightening cycle in a way that others have not. John, very quickly here, are we simply prepared for 4%? I would suggest we are not. I don't think we are either, yeah. Tom. At it's all. just that simple. On the data, John, let's get through this quick because Victoria's uh, been patient to wait. Futures deteriorate negative 40 before J.P. Morgan. They come down to negative 57 now with Nulo's Dow getting near negative 500. The VIX out of stick, 28. What do you see, John? We're down 1.5%. We see further curve inversion, two-year yields higher, the 10-year yield a little bit lower. We're seeing that again today, 292.62 on a 10-year. And I mentioned that breakdown accrued. We should go there again. Tom, 93.92. On WTI, we're down another 2.5%. Deterioration in EM, even if someone like the Philippine Bank steps in with a rate uh, increase. Within this tumult, Victoria Fernandez joins us, Chief Market Strategist at Crossmark Global Investment. Victoria, what should mere mortals do here? Well, it's tough, Tom, because I think there is so much confusion out there right now. I mean, you guys have rattled off all these different things that are going on right now. We've got highest inflation numbers we've seen in decades, but yet at the same time, we've got 10-year yields falling. We've got five-year and 10-year break-evens at their um, kind of historical averages. And so it's this concern of, in my opinion, more what we're going to see the ECB do next week. I think that's going to flow through and really cause some volatility in the markets. Um, when you're looking at all of this, what we're doing with our clients is really just trying to nibble a little bit here and there in the markets to balance out our portfolio we've pulled back on some of our value names we've added a little bit of growth but it all comes down to quality Tom we with earnings season here you need quality of earnings quality of balance sheets we looked at the balance sheets with the banks this morning uh, this is where you've got to focus so we've actually done some names like a waste management we've done some names like general dynamics um, that have those features associated with them victoria has the past week and what we've seen in terms of the cpi and now what we've gotten from jp morgan caused you to increase your view of where we are in the cycle in other words are we halfway through the sell-off are we three quarters uh, or are we almost there yeah, I've really kind of shifted my thought a little bit, Lisa, over the last week, more in the terms of I, I do think that recession is probably a little bit sooner rather than later compared to where I was before. When we've talked recently, we were looking at second half of next year for recession to come in. I think that's been brought forward again a lot of because of what we're seeing in Europe. Um, we have the Fed here that has said they're going to do whatever they need to do for inflation. I mean, I don't think they want to do like a Thelma and Louise and drive us off the cliff, but I think they're willing to go right up to the edge um, in order to bring that down, and that's going to affect growth. So I think we have to be prepared for that. I do think it's interesting, however, in the J.P. Morgan release, Jamie Dimon said consumer spending was high and the ability to spend was still strong. So I do think we have some counter trends at work that perhaps means if we go into recession sooner, it won't be a deep recession. There is a consensus building this week, Victoria, about going into duration, going into long dated bonds, because whatever the trajectory is in the near term, the long term is lower inflation and lower growth. Are you piling onto that? 
So we've actually been extending our duration in all of our fixed income um, strategies. We've been short duration for a long period of time, and that's worked really well for us over the last year. And um, we're not going long versus the benchmark, but we are getting closer to neutral from where we've been. And I think that's the best way to play that right now. So you give yourself the room to go shorter or longer, depending on what you're seeing develop over the next couple of quarters, but you're seeing more and more of that. I think people realize longer term, like you're saying, yields will be lower. 270 on the 10 year is kind of that level we'd be watching that we think will stay above, um, but we call for a high of between three and three and a quarter on the 10 year this year. Obviously we went above that a little bit um, last month, but yet I think that might be where we end up at the end of this year. Victoria, awesome to get your views on this show. As always, Victoria Fernandez there of Crossmark Global Investments working through some really interesting calls on Wall Street. Wall Street adjusts in a major way. We talked about Bank of America. It started with Michael Gapen looking for that recession in the second half of this year over at Bank of America. Savita Subramaniam had to adjust to that. She's now looking for 3,600 on the S&P, down from 45. Then we get this call from City Lisa, a 100 basis point hike in July is the most likely outcome. And I think the bigger call here, and I said this a little bit earlier when we started the program, it's not about 75 or 100 at the end of July. The bigger, bigger call here is whether you think this Fed has to go a whole lot further for longer. They've got the Fed at 4% by the end of 22. That's much more important, Lisa, as to whether this Fed goes 75 or 100 month end. And embedded in that comment is, is that going to be the end? Is this front loading? Is this aggressive front loading to bring things down quickly? Or is this the beginning of something that they are concerned is more protracted? And that I think is also a huge discrepancy when you talk long term, especially when you talk about long dated bonds and the conviction into duration. John, I think the, par the Fed parlor game yesterday stopped. I don't know what else to say. What I'm looking at in the market here, particularly the way that yen is deteriorating, is we come much more into a correlated global moment where gaming a given central bank, when are they going to do this, when are they going to do that, is really not part of the analysis. Well, tell me what the BRJ is going to do in response to some of this, Tom, because maybe that is... Well, there's a bet there, and there's you. people smarter than me looking at that. But the, the bottom line is, find me somebody that believes yield curve control in Japan is a valid, doable process, key phrase, over time. Nobody believes that. And when does it break is the, is the arch question. Lisa, can they resist what's coming? another 100 basis point move at the front end. Can they resist what's coming as you do see the dollar ascendant? That, I think, is the key question. Or do they have to wait till some of that pressure comes off for them to actually capitulate to show that they're doing it on their own terms? And that's been the idea. But at a certain point, the levels become very difficult for them. And are we getting to that point? It feels like five minutes ago we said, can we break 107 on the dollar index and then 108? And Tom, we're staring right, down the barrel of 109. We're looking right at one, now. I, I, this is really important, folks. Dollar index 107, 108, 109. That's major trading. Europe's 54% of it or, or, or something. The BBDXY shows the same tension today, John, and that's the folded in EM tension as well. I'd like to hear from the big multinationals, the tech names with decent exposure to Europe. Yeah. With the one two hit coming from a weaker economy. And just a much, much weaker euro in the face of some of this. Futures are down 1.5% with Tom Keane and Lisa Bravitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow for our audience worldwide. Heard on radio, seen on TV. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Officials at the Federal Reserve may debate a historic 1% point rate hike later this month. Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic told reporters that everything is in play after U.S. consumer prices rose up faster than expected 9.1% in the year through June. Investors bet the Fed is more li than likely to hike rates by 100 basis points at the next meeting. Donald Trump reportedly is looking at announcing in September that he'll run for president again. That's according to the Washington Post. The newspaper says that allies are telling the former president that announcing before the November midterm elections will drive turnout to help Republicans take over Congress. In Israel, President Biden committed to extending an agreement that provides billions of dollars for the Israeli military. He signed a joint declaration with Israel's Prime Minister Yair Lapid. The document also says the two countries will never allow Iran to acquire a nuclear bomb. 
And in the UK, another round of Conservative Party balloting is set for today in the process that will determine the next Prime Minister. The field of candidates has now been cut to six. Former Chancellor Rishi Sunak and Trade Minister Penny Mordaunt have emerged as the front runners. At least one member of the field will be knocked out after today's vote. A dispute has erupted between London's Heathrow Airport and one of the biggest airlines in the Middle East. Emirates rejected Heathrow's demands to cut capacity and says it will operate flights as planned. The carrier flies six Airbus A80 Super Jumbos to Heathrow every day. Emirates says Heathrow isn't giving it enough time to rebook travellers onto other flights. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. This report reflects that inflation is unacceptably high. Our economy looks well positioned to, to deal with the challenges faced by the Fed attempting to cool uh, inflation um, and the uh, Russia's war against Ukraine. And uh, we are really going to be hoping that the Federal Reserve can uh, pull off this soft landing. I'm looking at that and I have, to, I have to laugh. It's over to you, the Federal Reserve, to engineer the soft landing and bring inflation down. We'll give them the space to do that. That was Cecilia Rouse there, the chair of the White House Council of Economic Advisors. A lot to talk about in this market. Let's do that and avoid the politics. Futures down by 1.4% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, we're down by one full percentage point. The latest from Citi, they look for a 100 basis point move on the Fed funds rate month end, and they look for 4% year end. There are some massive calls out there at the moment. Your 10 year, 293.92. Crude lower by two full percentage points right now, 94.28. We need to talk about JP Morgan as well. Jamie Dimon on the earnings media call right now saying inflation might be higher than you expect. The stock is lower than some people were looking for this morning. We're down 3%. Earnings miss, suspending the share buyback, preparing for bad times ahead. Basically, Jamin Dimon also saying, Tom, that if we get those bad times, the consumer is strong enough to withstand some of that pain. So that's the latest from JP Morgan and the earnings call. Focusing on the correlations now, just because of the shortness here, we'll get to this later. A substantial markets on the move at right now. John, I've got to go to 210 spread, which moments ago was a negative 27 basis points, 0.27% percentage points difference in the 10 year and two year. What's your single statistic, John? The theme over the last 24 hours, I'm looking at the same thing from the yield curve, Tom, is two year yields higher, 10 year yields lower. And Lisa's talked a lot about it. I'm on the same page as Lisa here. Yeah. That is the prospect of higher Fed rates ahead and a prospect of slower growth in our future. Let's take what we see in the correlations of the market and go to the single correlation for Washington, which is no one's getting paid anything given this high inflation. It's the real wage reality that all of Washington faces. Andrew Blocker has spent years looking at this. Ec 10 told him at Harvard uh, years ago, guess what? Jobs matter, the wage matters. He is with Invesco as global head of public uh, policy. Andy, what is the urgency this time around of a horrific negative real wage? Well, politically, it's it can be death um, for politicians. So, Right now, we talk about the economy always being the most important thing. Well, inflation is a major part of the economy that talks about how people actually live every day. And so with this latest spike, just 9.1%, and us not seeing the top um, soon enough for the November elections, I think it can have a real impact on what's happening in the midterm elections. I guess the suits and ties will tell us that a higher unemployment rate is good for us right now. Explain that to the American people. How does Mr. Powell, frankly, how does President Biden sell a higher unemployment rate is good for you as we bring inflation down? So, of course, you give me the tough task here, but theoretically, the thought would be a higher unemployment rate would actually soften uh, wage inflation and which can be the core of inflation. So they're really focused on getting down inflation for, and if you're just looking at it from an inflation perspective, it could be good. But the, the, but the other side of it is it's, it's an economic downturn potentially. So um, they are really trying to walk that fine line. And as you've seen, you guys have been talking about, you know, we've had the 75 basis point increase. We're looking at a full point um, 
this 400 basis points, this is this is a tough place to be right now. And I'm just glad I'm not working at the Fed to try to navigate this. Meanwhile, in the here and now, we're trying to parse out the rhetoric of uh, President Biden and some of his associates with what they actually are planning to do uh, with respect to going after companies that they are accusing of price gouging. I'm thinking of oil companies, for example, but I'm wondering who's next, considering the fact that places like airlines are not increasing capacity in the face of uh, increasing demand. How much is this going to be a reality? Is there meat behind some of these threats uh, versus just simply lip service? Well, there's only meat behind the threats if there's actual um, malfeasance. So, I mean, that remains to be seen. Look, the, the administration right now is in the toughest of all worlds. They have high inflation. They have a potential recession on, on, the, on the horizon. They have um, people really feeling the pain. And so they, make, they need to make sure that they are out there looking at every lever they can, pulling every lever to help make things better. And so whether it's going to Saudi Arabia, which we, you know, we've heard that may not be about oil, but we know it's a big part of it is oil, um, or whether it's going after um, companies in the U.S., they're trying to pull every lever to make it look like they are doing everything they can for the American people. And when they have no more levers, Andy, they say, look to the Fed, they're going to do everything. It's their job. How politicized right now is the Fed? Well, the reality is the Fed's been politicized for some time, and I don't want to go too far here, but, I mean, we've gone from a dovish Fed, um, who many people would think were late to the inflation um, acknowledgement, saying it was short term, um, to now where they are really kind of putting on the gas to raise rates. And, and it, to say that politics didn't play a role in both being dovish at the beginning and now being hawkish, I, I think would be missing the point. Andy? So well said there. Andy Blocker there of Invesco. The White House put out a statement yesterday off the back of the inflation report and Lisa at the end it said we will continue to give the Fed the right space or something like that to bring inflation down and we all read between the lines there didn't we? Well, there was also other nuances that were pretty interesting in that statement, including their focus on core CPI. The Fed basically has come out and said headline CPI is actually more important this time around. We've seen that in a number of anecdotal reports around the edges. And then the president saying, but look, core CPI is coming down, so that's good. He also talked about how this is backward looking. I mean, suddenly it's the economist, the chief economist sure, in yeah. the White House, as he tries to soften a pretty bleak message. I think you can thank Brian Deese, the National Economic Council director, for some of those speaking points, perhaps. Euro dollar has been breaking down 10006 that currency pair is negative about a half of 1% when we broke parity yesterday the ecb had this for a statement the european central bank does not target a particular exchange rate however and this is classic classic from a central bank however we are always attentive to the impact of the exchange rate on inflation in yeah. line with our mandate for price stability in other words tom let me translate this year is weak, and it's making our problem with inflation a whole lot bigger. David Malpass, now at the World Bank, was very articulate about this. John, you have a depreciation. It all gets rationalized by the fancy people in bow ties. Guess what? None of it matters. You're poor. That's all there is to it. John, I've got to look at the hallmark here. Round it up. Bloomberg dollar index right out near new record level with that EM weakness. And, John, I would suggest a 1300 on BBDXY, that's somewhat equivalent to Dow 10,000. Where's the Dow now, Tom? Dow is 30. It's down 500 points earlier. It's instructive. 30,290. It's down, down 500. 500. If I wake up and says someone says the Dow's down like a couple, of, that means nothing to me. Okay, what does that mean well, to, to, to anyone? all of America, One and a half it's percent. a big deal. But if, you're, if you went to sleep for 20 years and woke up, it's a much bigger deal, isn't it? Because we're obsessed with Dow points. <laughs> I mean, what is it? It's American. It's, it's an American thing, John. And Tom, I think you underestimate the knowledge of some people in these markets that they've moved away from that. There is a reason that the whole of Wall Street does not offer Dow forecasts. They don't. Do they? And no, you know that. Well, no, I they think don't. Who offers do. a Dow forecast year-end? Name the bank. Yeah, I'll have to go look. Go look. We're down 1.4% on the S&P. From New York City, Tom Key, Lisa Brambis and Jonathan Farrow. This is Bloomberg. For those of you interested in sending me abuse on Twitter, perhaps, about how important the Dow is, Twitter's down. Yeah. So maybe wait or... I don't know, find me on LinkedIn, send it there. <laughs> Is it, can we blame it on Elon? Maybe, Tom. Got no idea. Lisa, what's the story there? 
basically just there have been a number of uh, usage outages uh, reported for thousands of users, that wow. according to oh. a couple of different reports, and it just <clears throat> has an error screen when people log in. So we can't moan about PPI on Twitter this morning. Correct. We can do that with Mike McKee, though, right here on Bloomberg TV and radio, breaking the economic data. Mike, what do you see? Uh, we're going to have a lot of people moaning today about a 100 basis point move because PPI comes in hot as well as the CPI did. Final demand month over month up 1.1 percent. That's an increase from uh, the prior month that uh, originally was reported as eight tenths. The uh X food and energy category comes in up four tenths. That's a little bit of a decline. Much of the PPI for final demand comes in uh, hot because of energy, they say. On a year over year basis, we're at 11.3 percent. That's up from 10.8. So that's a kind of scary big number. Jobless claims, a uh, big jump, it looks like. 244,000 are filed. That's uh, compared to 235,000. And I'll get the. Uh, the prior month, uh, week's uh, uh, revision in here, if I can, in just a second. Uh, it's an increase of 9,000 on the month. So that uh, this set of data are not going to be well received by folks uh, on Wall Street. And I bet if you check the bond market now, you're going to see a reaction. I, I see that, Mike. Uh, you know, folks, I just did a moving average study here, claims, and my single number is just arbitrary, is 207,000. Mike McKee, when do we blink on claims moving from an arbitrary 207,000 up to 244,000? Well, we're probably going to take a while, Tom, because it is such high-frequency data. People want to make sure that it's not a one-off or some kind of a fluke. But if we get a couple more weeks where we see these kinds of jumps, then people are going to get nervous about it. Now, this is July, and July is when a lot of auto plants shut down for retooling. So historically, there is a seasonal adjustment problem here. Uh, mm. The retooling weeks are different each year, so it's hard for them to account for that. So it may be that this is just an unusual situation where uh, we're seeing people on temporary layoff. But if this is a trend that continues, obviously it's something that's going to worry the Fed. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. And looking forward to your conversation with Governor Waller. Yes, uh, later. And I have to say, Mike, there's no one better to do it. Tom, Mike's going to sit down with Governor Waller a little bit later today. Lisa, what time was that? That's at 11.30 a.m. 11.30 a.m. Really, really that. important. Let me sell Couldn't Waller. Waller's out of St. Louis, John. When they reinvented statistical and research analysis, St. Louis led the way. And Waller is a distillate of that. So I'm really looking forward Very cool, Tom. Uh, to that as well. Right now, Conrad de Quadros with the senior economic advisor at Bring Capital. And this is the conversation of the day. If you're worried about where that so-called terminal uh, rate is, there's three Three, there's three and a half. John Farrell just mentioned 4% at a given bank. Okay, you outdo them all. What happens to us if we go to a Breen Capital 4.5%? Well, maybe we make some progress on bringing inflation down. I mean, the, obviously, the, the problem of the day right now is, is inflation. Um, we've had over the course of the last two and a half years a number of poor narratives on inflation, right? We started with the uh, COVID's going to be disinflationary. That went for six months with economists and the Fed. Then it's inflation is going to be transitory. It's only in a handful of goods. We saw in yesterday's CPI report that um, it's neither transitory, obviously, um, and we have very broad-based increases. I mean, it looks to us like underlying inflation is, is somewhere in the neighborhood of 5% now if we look at those trimmed means and medians and sticky price measures. So, so the problem of the day is dealing with inflation. Um, and you raise a very important point on that terminal Fed funds rate. And the, the, the idea here from the Fed is to get policy to neutral and maybe a little bit beyond neutral. But the problem is I think they're misjudging neutral. The 2.5% neutral rate is a neutral rate that existed when inflation was still at 2%. We're not at 2% anymore, and it's a nominal rate. So that neutral rate is, is probably higher, uh, and I think the Fed has got some work to do to get policy tight and bring inflation down. The terminal rate, 4.5%. The path to get there is important to understand. Is this a front-loading? Is this a rapid uh, rate rise of 100 basis points at several consecutive meetings? Or is this a gradual and steady, painful drip, drip, drip of let's get it up there because it's not coming down when we look at inflation? Well, Lisa, I think that the, the Fed will take what the, the market gives it. Uh, and right now, the market is is giving the Fed uh, basically a green light to go by 100 basis point at the July meeting. So unless that changes before July 27th, I think the Fed will take that. They've told us that they want to get 
Um, they, as you said, they want to front load these moves. They want to get the funds rate to what they think is is neutral and maybe a little bit beyond. And as I said, I think that that judgment uh, might be off. I think that the neutral rate is probably higher. I mean, if you if you think about it, if you look at the 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 Fed funds rate and put it in real terms, it's still significantly negative. And I don't know how. We bring inflation down with negative real rates. Conrad, when we take a look at some of the data that we've gotten this week, we've gotten the CPI, we got JP Morgan earnings and Morgan Stanley, and now we have PPI and perhaps more importantly, initial jobless claims coming out higher than expected, rising more than expected. Can you put into perspective how telling that is versus perhaps noise and data that has been pretty noisy? Yes, and I think that's the jobless claims are important. It's it's a very high frequency indicator of the labor market, as Mike pointed out, and I think this is a very important point that July is a difficult time to read jobless claims because of those auto shutdowns. And we had an announcement a couple of weeks ago from one of the large auto manufacturers that they're shutting down production until September, and that's related to shortages of parts. Um, but if we take a broader view of the labor market and we look at things like job openings, whether it's the BLS data on job openings or small business job openings for June, uh, which showed 50% of small businesses surveyed reported a job that they could not fill. Um, the record high, and we have data on that going back to 1973, the record high was 51 last month. So we have very high levels of job openings. Um, we might see some pickup in, in, in layoff rates, but, but right now, if we look at the, the broader data or the small business data, it looks like there are a lot of jobs out there to fill. So as people lose jobs, I think there'll be opportunities to, to get jobs in, in, with other firms. Conrad, long ago, there were research reports that would come out, and there was a young Turk named John Writing, who you have a nodding acquaintance with, that would write about Tumult, like 1998. I remember this very clearly, waiting for Elliot Platt's book and all of it and all the research from Bear Stearns and uh, DLJ and such. Are we back there now? When you look at the correlations out there, the deterioration in EM, 210 spread in a heartbeat down to 27 basis points an hour ago, are we getting back to that kind of tension in the global system? Well, I, I, I think one of the things that we're trying to adjust here is to a market that is um, is more on its own. It's less being influenced by by the Fed in terms of, of um, its balance sheet, right? So we have the Fed that's begun the process of normalizing the balance sheet. I think that that's had very important implications for the functioning of markets. Um, and, and it raises other issues, right? Uh, in, in my opinion, the, uh, we can look now at the Fed's shift in its, its monetary policy framework to flexible inflation average targeting and say that that's been a disaster for price stability. But I also think the other issue we have to deal with is we've had over the last 15 years or so a shift in the Fed's reserve policy, and this relates to markets. Um, and the first Fed has shifted to an ample reserves policy, but with tight regulations on bank liquidity. And I think that we're going to have some stresses to deal with as it begins to reduce its balance sheet, mm -hmm. as forward funding rates are now a lot less certain. If you think back to late May and you told people that SOFR, for example, would be 2.5% at the end of July right, or approximately, right, right. That, that would have been a shock, right? So there's a lot more uncertainty in funding rates. Um, the Fed is pulling back on, on uh, the size of its balance sheet. And aggregate liquidity is still very high. Um, but we've right. learned over the last few years that liquidity doesn't necessarily get to markets that need it. And so we've had these, these policies. We had the blow up in the Treasury market in March. I mean, these are some of the issues that we, that we still have to deal with and I think, think are still out there given the Fed's reserve policy. Conrad DeCuartos, thank you so much. We have to go to some breaking news here, but uh, greatly, greatly appreciate it. John, Mr. Diamond's rationalizing the world. He is. And Shanali Basak is listening in on the earnings call with the media. This is what he had to say about the regulator. The regulators had a new test, which we don't agree with, but they had it. <laughs> it puts you in the wrong time, reducing credit in the marketplace and reducing buybacks. For those of you just tuning in, JP Morgan suspending the share buyback program. Got some insight from the CFO as well on this call, Tom. This is pretty interesting. Consumers still don't feel so pinched by inflation that they're cutting back on discretionary spending, and that's a relatively positive sign. That from JP Morgan, the card spending data from B of A spoke to a little bit of a different picture based on what's been happening yeah. with gas prices. But here's a headline on gas prices from the CFO. The average consumer spending on gas is up 35 percent, 535 percent year on year. That's the number from JP Morgan. I can fold in the card spending data from Bank of America to give you a bigger picture. For the low income cohort in America right now, they're spending about 10 percent of the wallet, Tom, on gas alone. Well, th there's that part. I think that's very true. And on the EM basis, of course, it's so much uh, food as we see in Egypt and Sri Lanka. But, 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 John, what to me is so, so important here is a decile analysis 
of the effect of whatever kind of recession you want to call it, even a growth recession. It affects so many different parts of America in unique ways. You know what? The haves are still spending. No question about that. What do you make of that headline, Lisa? that Shanali just sent me over listening in on that call with Jamie Dimon. The regulators had a new test, which we don't agree with, but they had it. Basically trying to say it's not that we're so gloomy and then trying to paint it a little more positive by saying consumers to look like they're spending, which helps them in terms of increasing some of the loans. I mean, let's just uh, call a spade a spade here. Uh, if you take a look, though, at the Bank of America issue and the, the credit card data, it also is confirmed in airline travel and even the CPI report that we got yesterday where that was actually one area where prices came down. And there are signs that airline travel is starting to decline in the face of some of these higher prices. So it's clear that that there has been some sort of offset from the higher gas prices and from the inflationary winds themselves. Delta, you want to say something about Delta? No? Okay. No Delta. Lisa's I, got thoughts. I, Everyone I, knows I Lisa's that, got you thoughts. Know, when you talk about whether people are reducing travel, um, is it for the experience? Is it because of the price? Getting stuck at an is airport somewhere you don't want to be. Are, are we ready are for failed. Conrad to call this as world a 4.5% terminal uh, rate? I, I, I don't think know. so. Tom. I mean, City, we're talking up 4% year end. Futures are down 1.25% on the S&P. TK, I'm um, taking a day off tomorrow. Oh, it's you and Lisa I did not know that. all day on Bloomberg TV and, and night. on radio and all night apparently too. I'll catch you with you next week. TK, because oh. I love you, this is for you. The Dow, down there we 438. Go. <laughs> right. There we go. That's my goodbye gift for a long weekend. And a kind of copper, 34 and 3 eighths. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. The U.S. Senate is getting closer to a deal on President Biden's economic agenda, but the state and local tax deduction issue threatens to spark a showdown amongst Democrats. Senator Joe Manchin has been negotiating with Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. Manchin says the federal deduction, popular in high-tax states known as SALT, hasn't been in the mix. That could doom the bill's prospects. The U.S. House has passed a bill to help state and local governments set up a warning system for active shooter situations. The legislation gained new urgency after shootings in Texas, New York and Illinois. Many Republicans opposed it, calling it an encroachment on rights of gun owners. Sri Lanka's President Gotabaya Rajapaska has arrived in Singapore after fleeing protests in his own country. Singapore says he has not yet asked for asylum. Rajapaska missed a Wednesday deadline to submit his resignation. There have been months of protests in Sri Lanka over soaring inflation, shortages of food, fuel and medicine. In Manhattan, apartment rents soared to another record high last month. The median for a new lease, $4,050. That is 25% higher than a year ago. That's according to appraiser Miller Samuel and brokerage Douglas Elliman Real Estate. Competition for Manhattan apartments is fierce and is expected to get even more intense in the coming months. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. On whether we get back to call it 2%, 3%, um, that's not likely to happen before 2023. Uh, and in our view, we, we do hover around that 2 to 3% range, which we do think the Fed will ultimately uh, accept as the new normal. Mona Mahaja there on where we are in these markets. And I guess, Lisa, there's a little bit of a breath here. I mean, we had negative 27 beeps on twos, tens. It's a little bit better, but I'm, I'm, I'm struggling here, Lisa, in a day of significant tension. The story of the week to me is the dollar, at least in markets. <clears throat> yes, it is a dollar totally ascended. Agree. And right now what that is telling us is that the Fed is going to have to hike rates, but more importantly, that there's so much uncertainty globally that mm. is the only haven that people really are finding respite in. And it is one that is highly concerned Concerning for a lot of places in this world. Long ago and far away, Lehman Brothers was a shop that excelled in the fixed income trading market. When Lawrence McDonald worked there, he made them some money. He went on to do all sorts of other things, including books and, of course, the Bear Traps Report. But what he's really known for is every once in a while writing an essay where in a given year you stop. He did that this morning for the Esteem Zero Hedge. Larry, first thing I read this morning as well, I've been talking up Tunisia. 
is something interesting in the Middle East and in the Levant, and you are focused on the fixed income deterioration of emerging markets. We've seen this before, haven't we? Oh, Tom, it, it's amazing. This period that we're in right now is so amazing because once or twice a decade, maybe even three times in 20 years, you get a two, three, four week period where asset prices are moving at an accelerated pace so fast. Right. And normally economists that, that are on all the shows, they're looking at economic data. Right. But when, when risk assets are moving this fast, the risk, at, risk assets take over economic data. The difference here, Larry, the difference here, and this is really important, folks, is an immense esteem for Lawrence McDonald. While everybody else in the bow tie world was studying economics, McDonald was down at the Brothers Four in the Casino by the Sea on Cape Cod having a good time where he learned how to trade. And as you know, Larry McDonald, what this is about is the bid walks away. You've got a Bloomberg terminal behind you there uh, in your manse. Explain to me right now the character of the bid walking away right now. Well, it's the rate of change of asset prices, whether it be leveraged loans, emerging market bonds, uh, credit default swaps on banks. So we're seeing just, the, just the, the highest acceleration in the rate of change speed. It's literally as fast as COVID, as fast as Lehman. And economists around the world are looking at, okay, all these rate hikes. At the end of the day, credit risk is about to veto the Fed's policy path. In other words, the dollar is so strong, it's the global wrecking ball. Uh, the IMF, for example, is owed $100 billion, Tom, from emerging market countries. And the Fed is lighting uh, that balance sheet on fire right now. Well, but Larry, I'm trying to wrap my head around some of the rhetoric, which is incredibly poetic and describes the moment. Credit risk is about to veto the Fed's tightening path, that risk assets are taking over for economics. Basically, we're reaching a breaking point akin to a Lehman moment or even what we saw during COVID. Are you basically saying the Fed will have to backtrack or are you saying that there is a more, t more material Question. fissure uh, that's coming that's really uh, irredeemable given where the Fed is with inflation? Well, think of, you've done a great, Lisa, this morning, your job on the stress test has been phenomenal because if you look back on June, late June, the, the results came out and the media was really <laughs> celebrating these results. And now here we are, not even three weeks later, and there's a, a restatement of those results. That tells me that the regulators uh, saw a, a shock. Um, something is really scared the regulators for that type of change in position over 30 days. And if you look at the rate of change in bonds, copper and, um, and oil inside a 30 day period, we've never had a move like that without jobs being down like 100,000 to 200,000 within three months. So what's so the... It's, it's, yeah, go ahead. So what's the breaking point here? I mean, you talked about emerging markets. and You said multiply that by 10. And are we seeing that already beginning or are we not yet even seeing it? And we're just sort of on the precipice and we're seeing the beginnings of the breakage in the dollar, in what you're seeing with the Japanese yen, in what you're seeing in certain markets uh, for risk assets. The Fed is trying to stop inflation in the United States by promising, you know, a, a thousand rate hikes, essentially, right? I'm just exaggerating, but about 15 rate hikes, including one trillion of quantitative tightening. The rest of the world is not doing anything in that regard in the right. developed markets, except for maybe Canada. So what happens is when the dollar strengthens and you're in Indonesia or any emerging market country, you're trying to buy wheat, you're trying to buy corn, you're trying to buy oil, gas. You're, the Fed is essentially exporting inflation right. from the United States to the developing world, and they're crushing right. civilizations around the planet. Larry, I got this one question in before we go, and that is the famous shot of Lehman Brothers, and they're standing there watching the deterioration of the company, and the Gartman report is up on the guy's um, screen as well. That was a time of leverage. The optimists are pushing back against you saying the leverage here is not like it was in 98 or in the great financial crisis. Do you buy it or is the leverage just different in different place this time? Well, we, behind me, we run a Bloomberg chat, Tom, with institutional investors on the buy side in 20 plus countries. So we monitor the conversation in the last two, two weeks, three weeks. The conversation from buy side investors that run billions of dollars 
is focused on sovereign risk, and that's where your nose has been focused on this week. And so exactly, we've transferred the Lehman risk from the balance sheets of the banks yeah. to the sovereigns, and now <clears throat> the Fed's accelerating rates up, and they're blowing up the global bond market, and that's what's going right. to stop them. Larry McDonald, thank you so much. One of the essays of the summer, writing in Zero Hedge today, I just was, I thought it was fascinating. Lisa, this is, I got goosebumps, literally, Lisa, over not the similarities, but just some of the allusions here to what we've seen in other crises. I go back to, I think it's Ecuador in 1992, if my memory serves me right. We aren't seeing yet the fissure, though, in the credit space. We are not seeing companies completely unable to, Egypt. to raise uh, to raise money. I'm talking about companies yeah. uh, in particular. Yes. There are pockets of distress, but it's not the wholesale market shutdown, the market dysfunction that Michael Shaul is worried about happening. Doesn't mean it's not going to happen. But the fact that, and I think that this is a really important point that Larry raised, uh, the fact that the Fed is so worried about something coming down the pike, that they want that fortress of cash, J.P. Morgan, to start holding more cash and be really conservative with buying yes. back shares, tells you something very loud and very clear. That is the fundamental difference, Lisa, this time around, is the amount of cash held, whether directly by banks, indirectly central banks, or just by the public, is it, it's a radically different tone than what you've seen the three, four, five uh, times before. Futures at negative 50, Dow futures were negative 500, they're negative 469 now, the VIX 27.84, a little bit, of, I'm, I'm struggling here, folks, a little bit of improvement in the last hours about what I can do on it. Dollar, yen, 139.15. That is a wow, wow statistic. Please stay with us through the morning. These markets, absolutely fascinating. On radio and television, this is Bloomberg.